Kelly? Begin with the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome, everybody. Last meeting of the summer. Nice to have a crowd. It's nice to have a crowd, it is. We were here talking about ourselves in July, and we had no one. <laughs> it's totally uncool. However, Lori did watch it, so thank yeah, you. Yeah, she did. Yes. It wasn't unheard. So we begin with um, anyone like to move on the approval of the agenda? I'll move to approve. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, do we have any emergency additions or modifications? We do not. I guess that should have come first, huh? <laughs> By the time I'm no longer president, I still will not have figured out the job. So, uh, approval of the minutes. We do have one edit on the July 31st, Kathy. Do we have the new version? Do we. I brought it with me. We removed one sentence. From Six, I believe. Uh, it was on the June 26th. Oh, I'm sorry, June 26th. Yeah. On page six? Yeah, 7.5.5. Okay, .5. I feel a little funny saying this out loud again, but so the, the line says that um, I was struck by how the students at each school had a real and unique attachment to their individual schools. So we're just going to take that out. I actually was surprised that I was hearing the same thing at each school. So although we all think each school is unique in a way, the students are experiencing the same, same just thing. The one so just changing it. So I'll move to approve the minutes with that change. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And, uh, and now uh, I think we have three public comments at least, and I believe they're all associated with the summit of discussion. So we'll begin with the summit discussion. I'll let uh, you want to tee it up, Andy, and then, and then uh, we can hear from the uh, comments. Sure. So, uh, you know, as, as you guys as a board committed to back in June uh, with the decision to close Summit temporarily for this one school year, uh, we will have on a monthly basis an update on Summit, um, giving you uh, any new information that we can. Today, the most uh, relevant update is the work that Jim and I have done over the summer to um, try to honor the requests that you guys have made as far as seeking opportunities to make sure that it remains a active and uh, um, you know uh, important part of the upper Ohio community during this year uh, of transition um, so Jim and I have put forward a, a general concept for his program rock tree sky to utilize um, part of the site two classrooms um, during the school day as well as access to computer lab and Hartman Hall uh, details of it are outlined in your uh, materials um, I do believe that this is a good use of the property for this year. Again, he's been extremely uh, um, supportive of what we're doing and also been very flexible when each time I came back with needing one more thing, uh, he's uh, you know really been motivated to try to make sure that this does remain, a, again, a vibrant uh, um, community hub for Upper Ojai and the extent to which his program can help um, uh, do that. Uh, he's been very interested. So um, again, that's the, the primary thing that has taken place over the summer uh, with regard to the use of the space for this coming year. We did survey the former summer students, uh, summit students who have now uh, moved on to either San Antonio or Topa about the need for after school care. Um, the responses were between two and four kids who needed something between one to a couple days a week of need. Um, so we are trying to meet that need at San Antonio. Um, and seek opportunities to support them down there uh, because we don't see an after-school program that's a, a daily program being uh, really of need for, for the population. Um, we are working though with a number of other groups including Upper Ojai Council as well as the uh, successor group to the PTA, the uh, Condor Kids, um, is working on continuing to offer uh, you know, unique uh, enrichment opportunities for the kids in Upper Ojai. So those are the uh, you know current uses that we're working on trying to uh, provide for Upper Ojai. I can also add that uh, 
Mike and I went up to Summit um, maybe two weeks ago and met with a group including Kim and Barbara and uh, Thea and um, Marilyn was nice enough to be there notwithstanding her husband's being sick um, and uh, Marianne who can't be here tonight Marianne Ratcliffe because she's going to be traveling tomorrow um, and it was, I thought it was a really excellent discussion uh, we talked about different possibilities um, you know I think I think they're I think we'll hear more, you know, as details start to come out. Um, uh, I was happy to hear that, that there was uh, at least a, uh, an interest in trying to work with the district as opposed to immediately jumping towards doing a charter or trying to do a charter. Um, and at that time, it wasn't, I don't think, completely resolved about uh, the, the feeling about uh, Rock Tree Sky, but I was gratified to know, I think it was the night that we were up there. It had a big meeting and, and it looks like everyone's pretty well aligned about at least this coming use this year. I don't know if you want anything, Mike? No, I think that you got it. Uh, so why don't we hear from our public comments. We'll start with Kim. Hi, I'm Kim Eck, I think you all know. Um, I just wanted to update you about the activities of Condor Kids. Um, newly created from the Summit PTO. We renamed the Summit PTO and we adjusted our bylaws and our mission statement to reflect our new situation and we have continued our insurance coverage and we elected new board members. I'm the president, Danielle Bautista is vice president, Thea Wilcox is treasurer, and Teresa Zamora is our secretary. And these are all people who have been at some of the board meetings, so they are at school board meetings here. Um, membership is open to anyone wishing to support Upper Ojai and Ventura County kids in general. And we plan to create and support educational enrichment activities, as Andy was saying, at Summit this year. We just finished a very successful summer fest. Our last morning was this morning, and we had 19 children. Huh? So it was, we, we had a lot of fun this summer. I think it was really nice for those kids to have something each week and for us all to be there and for me to see my kids. So, um, uh, in the works for the future, um, we are partnering with, with partnering with the Ojai Rec Department and other individuals to offer cooking, photography, soccer, and art classes. We're lining them up. We're lining up the days and times at this time. Um, we're currently looking for funding from OEF and possibly from the school district to cover the computer lab one afternoon a week for two hours. We have uh, Chantal Salaslogs has said she could that is a good uh, Tuesday afternoons are a good day um, for the students to uh, use the computers and also for any adults wishing English language learning um, we plan to have a guacamole booth at Ojai Day to raise funds and so what we would like to do is we would like to be able to use the summit grounds kitchen restrooms computer lab Hartman Hall and room six which is the big one on the end in, in coordination with other groups uh, for our activities, depending on what they are, like the cooking class probably will need the kitchen. We would like to have exclusive use of room five, which is the what used to be the Condor Kids room or the preschool room next to room six. Um, and also to keep the uh, PTO shed, which is a storage shed that has all the PTO fundraising materials in it. So we'd like to have exclusive use of those two things. Um, we also are wondering about and thinking that um, Thea might be a great person to oversee the general calendar of activities. I think we need someone who's just focused on Summit to see what days people are doing things and maybe have a Google calendar that people can look at as we're trying to schedule things. Um, and we, of course we would want to make sure everyone that wants to use the campus can. Um, we're also a little concerned about the safety of the trees on campus. They haven't been trimmed and they're looking pretty shaggy and I know they were um, marked as needing help. Um, and finally, we will continue to look for and develop programs to, de to benefit children in cooperation with the school district. Thank you. Any questions? No. I actually, Chuck, do you have any immediate comment about the trees? Is that anything that's in the works? Is 
in the works, yes, and it's an issue district wide because of the stress of the town. Weren't a lot of those already trimmed after the the ones at Summit were not trimmed, and at, when the fire blew through, it blew down a lot of branches that they probably would have cut off, but they're looking very heavy right now. So, we're Thanks concerned. for bringing that to our attention. Okay, thank you. Barbara? Barbara Weiser. Good evening. Uh, my name is Barbara Weiser. <laughs> it's a new policy this year. Climbing starts now. Okay, got it. Um, all right, so uh, uh, as you know, we've been meeting, a group of interested parties has been meeting to discuss the future of Summit and our options for reopening the school. And we have um, debated and debated. We've come to agreement that a magnet would be the best option. Um, and we, and, and I think, we think that would probably be the best option to help strengthen Ojai School District um, and enrollment up in the Upper Ojai area. Um, and um, so we would like to devote our volunteer hours to facilitate the process of forming a magnet school up at Summit Elementary location. And we would like to strengthen this part the a partnership that we've been developing with the board and the school district to kind of make that happen. Um, our, for our initial steps would be to research the other local magnet schools in Ventura County, there's six of them, and determine how they started, the processes they used, the obstacles they faced, um, what resources they used to become successful, and we'll also research the other small school districts in the area, including Briggs, Mupu, Santa Clara, and Somis, and um, uh, mostly to determine how they're successful because they're small schools and how their student body is comprised and any other um, information that they may be able to give us about having a small, uh, other small schools. We're also looking, would like to look into local businesses to see um, and explore possible funding sources. There's a lot of um, agricultural businesses and environmental science businesses and um, other businesses like that that we may be able to um, uh, request funding from or find out if that's a possibility. Um, and also we we're going to research other funding sources such as grants and um, things that might come from the government or organizations that would support school magnet schools. Um, our group of drivers will, uh, will keep the board updated and our progress from report findings. Um, some of our, uh, I know this is about to go off. Okay, so uh, just really quickly, um, we would like support from the board in terms of we're planning on doing most of the work and looking for the funding and things like that and what we would ask for support from the board would be administrative logistics, guidance, and open communication, of course. Um, some of the focuses that we're thinking about are um, agricultural science and environmental science, uh, Spanish language acquisition. We were kind of thinking about dual immersion, but I think we might be more uh, comfortable in, in the immediate with a Spanish language acquisition. And um, then also, we were also uh, um, recently considering soil and plant science. Um, just uh, as kind of a, a start, and that would be kind of a more um, marriage between environmental science and agricultural science, because sometimes the, those two the, uh, disciplines butt heads a little bit. So kind of just kind of make that a little bit better, and that might actually it would be a good start, and it might um, be something that we could build into an agricultural science program or a more strong or stronger environmental science program too. From that. Um, uh, I, uh, of course, ideally, we would uh, want a magnet school, and but we would be prepared to uh, research have starting a charter school if a magnet school didn't, for some reason, wasn't an option. Any questions? Do you know if, if any of those other schools you mentioned, the smaller ones, Briggs, Mupu, Santa Clara, Somis, do any of them have magnets? Do you know? I believe not. When you're looking at them, it would be interesting to find out how far their students come from. Mm -hmm. You know, are they close from, you know, are they driving from Thousand Oaks? Mm -hmm. Where are they coming from? You're sending someone to Mupu, right? My, did I, didn't you say when you spoke a few months ago, was it? My children? Yes. Yes. Yeah. We live half a mile from Mupu. Okay. They can walk there. So, <laughs> that's, <laughs> so uh, that's a drop. So, yeah, I know, I mean, I know that there's, that is an issue that how far some it is from a lot of places, but I think 
I think that we could have a really strong science program there. And soil science, plant science, agricultural science, um, I think the area that kind of lends itself to having something like that. And I think, I think if it's a really strong, interesting program, I think it would be a draw. I think parents would be willing to drive. So that was going to be my question. Mm -hmm. um, these all sound really interesting, but do we have any data that suggests that there is pent up demand for these specific things, these specific areas? Or how did, how did your group decide ag, language acquisition, soil science? How did you sort of uh, settle on those? Um, we, well, we decided, uh, settled on the language acquisition uh, because of the school in Ventura that is dual immersion. That's a pretty big draw. I think they're always full. And it's really hard to get in. Once uh, a child hits second grade, you pretty much can't uh, have your child go there anymore. Um, partly because of the dual immersion program. And then it's just, it's full. And it's, so there's a waiting list. Um, the agricultural science and environmental science. Um, the, the same school in Ventura also does an environmental science program. So um, I think we were kind of thinking about that too. And it, there's just a lot of environmental science programs in the area. It's just a big thing in, in California. And I think it's just a bigger and bigger discipline. More universities and colleges are having um, environmental science programs, which take from other disciplines instead of having such segregated disciplines. So I think that was part of mine. And I have a science background, so that's, <laughs> that's a big part of it too. <laughs> Santa Paula just um, by, uh, yeah. Thank you. What did I read? <laughs> big uh, investment, ranch. yeah. Big investment for FFA program and a big agricultural. Yeah. Science. So that they just acquired that last year, and right. so they're transitioning over from their old farm to their new farm. Um, Limonera has put a lot of funding into that. Limonera is a local, you know, the. That's you know, a CTE. That's but for high school, right? Or uh, it's an I ag science academy. School, I, I believe uh, they're going to have all K twelve yeah, access. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Which you can do with CTE. But yes, it did come from CTE funding sources. But there's not a well. school on the campus, on the farm. On the right. to the I farm. think they're going to go there, yeah. but I'm not 100% sure. Is there a school? So there, there's an uh, agricultural science or agricultural science academy at both the middle school at Isabel and at Santa Paula High School. And then I believe I'm not entirely sure about this, but I believe Bedell uh, School, which is adjacent to the farm or really close to the farm, might have some, um, might be having some programs there. I'm not 100% sure about that. That is a little bit of hearsay. I would just um, say it seems like Miners Oaks has been doing a lot in that direction. Mm -hmm. So I would look at what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, you would probably want to differentiate or not. I don't know. But I think it would be worth looking at. Right, because uh, food, for food for Thought is down at uh, Miners Oaks also. Is that the program that you're referring to? Or is there an additional I think they're program? doing additional things. Oh, they are? Okay. Yeah. yeah, definitely. We would definitely look into that. That's a good suggestion. And Food for Thought does have a garden be behind Summit, and I believe they're interested in you know, maintaining that and keeping up with that. I think I went over my time. Well, you know, that's interesting to talk, you know, so if you have something here in the valley, and if Santa Paula sounds like they have something, it, it might be, it might be worth discuss finding something that's a little different. Like if you're already in Santa Paula, mm -hmm. and you've got a school that offers that, or if you're in the valley and you've got a school that offers that, would you go to Summit for something different, like a, a a STEAM, you know, science, technology, art, and math, and math, you know, something different than what the, they're doing. I don't know, I'm just. Right, actually, that was, another thing we were considering was a STEM, uh, STEM program also, in addition. I know, there, I know there's some concern about having too much at one time, but I think it might be, I, I would go, I, it might be doable. I have, I have confidence <laughs> that that could be doable. But we will look into, yeah, the, the having Bedell be part of that ag science program. I, that's a new. I just actually heard about that a couple days ago. So, um, yeah, we may have to refocus a little bit, too. But I think there's, I mean, having so many, and Fillmore also has an ag science program. So, I'm not, I mean, it might be fine to have that many schools <coughs> that are involved in it also, just because, I mean, the, they're kind of far enough apart that they could draw students that are a little closer to them. And it's such a big agriculture area. Agriculture area. Well, I'm excited about the possibilities. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Mr. Bailey. Yes, sir. Jim Bailey. This is all for the record, so that's why we have to say your whole name. You, Social Security, please. <laughs> <laughs> We're about to say how much I make. So, um, Barb. Yes. 
you had me at soil science. I love soil science. Little known fact, I almost changed my major at Cal Poly to soil science <laughs> because um, it was that fascinating and the teacher was that good and the class was that challenging. Um, thank you, board. Uh, it has been a long summer. I'm so happy that August 14th is finally here. <laughs> um, and I want to tell you, just, I just want to clarify a little bit about Rock Tree Sky, just so you know, everybody on the board's clear. And I just want to share you know, what our vision is and hope for being able to use the school for the 2018-19 school year, right? So I just want to remind board that we are a nonprofit. We are a 501c3 educational nonprofit. And uh, the, the two directors uh, uh, each make $20,000. So nobody is lining their pocket with what's going on from Rock Tree Sky. So I just want to be clear about that. I know that you know, there was a question that came up at Neighborhood Council. Uh, you know, well, hey, you know, you guys going to use this public space and, and make a lot of money. But that's, you know, not why we're in it, if, if you know myself and you know Natasha. Um, so we have five staff members and we, that are full-time, and we pay each of them uh, above living wage in California. And that's important to us. They're all members of the Ojai community. They all live here in town. So we have a great spot where we're at. The Makerspace, Jane, thank you for coming by that morning. The Makerspace, uh, I think, has been a, a work of love. Oded helped, uh, actually, should I say helped, actually, Oded and his, his family built the stop motion animation station, and his son um, set us <coughs> up to how to use the software to make it go. Um, so the space inside is beautiful, and it's lovely, and I love it, and it'd be nice for a year to experiment with using a little more space. Uh, if we were able to be at the Summit Campus next year, uh, we could offer a little more direct instruction and some quieter spaces, which I know that uh, my staff and uh, our students would appreciate. You know, I've already envisioned a Science 101 class. My wife, Natasha, uh, has a whole you know, potential schedule that she'd be ready to, to roll out if we had a little more quiet space. So we imagine using the space for that to really focus on on learning you know and to keep with the history that's been at summit you know for learning for 107 years did i get that right 107 100 so, yeah. yeah and you know it just always makes me think of when i was working for ousd and i got to travel around i taught at summit for four years and uh i, I still remember a picture a student ashley sangstacken drew a picture of me uh, freckles, short reddish hair, holding a, a little beaker with some stuff foaming up out of it. And uh, I don't know if we actually did that experiment. I know we did use some beakers to uh, dole out where the Earth's water is distributed as part of an activity. But um, I still have that picture. And in fact, social media, fun fact, that was my first Facebook profile picture. Um, so. <laughs> So, uh, you know, my, my point is, is it's always been a really beautiful spot where I've enjoyed doing science, and I hope that next year we can do a little more there and really be a good neighbor and utilize that space well. So, thank you. Jim, Any questions? I, yeah, I have one. Yes. So first is, is there was some talk about you potentially helping out with after school. Yes. Is that... Is there anything formal formalizing no, about that? Nothing's just, been formalized. Yeah. The offer is there, and yeah. it it's really would be an easy thing for us, I think. Yeah. And uh, I'd be glad to do it, you know, seriously. And, and the other thing is, so so one to be clear for the record, for yeah. people watching, you're going to pay rent. Well, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. yeah you it's, love it's okay. I mean, it's absolutely. in the record, but I just want to make that clear to everyone. when you Working, mention. negotiating with district for, you know, fair market value based on, you know, the the um, uncertainties that might be involved with, with that. But absolutely, we'd yeah. be paying rent. <laughs> and, that, and that's the other thing I wanted to mention is that you're, you're okay with the fact that we can't enter into a traditional lease which would give you an actual right to the space, yes. but instead we can only grant a license that could at any moment, although that's we correct. don't think it will happen, but we could potentially call you and say, hey, Jim, unfortunately, starting tomorrow, we got to take it back. Right. You I totally, it. I understand that. Andy and I spoke in detail about that. Um, you know, my wife, we spoke with our board about that in detail and weighed the pros and cons, did the old cost-benefit analysis, and we said, we can do that. I mean, we're not getting rid of our other space by any means. Uh, you know, Summit 
allows us to experiment with some other some other options for learning that we'd like to offer to our homeschool families. You know, these kids are all public homeschool kids, and uh, you know, we provide some social socially embedded learning, which is really you know, Cheryl can share with you. Social, you know, we are social animals. We learn socially, and so when they come to a program like ours, uh, what they're doing at home and what we offer can go that much further. You know, we're we're social learners. Were janitorial services talked about in the agreement? We, I think we did talk about, uh, you know, in the, in the paperwork there, we talked about um, taking care of those things, you know, changing out the toilet paper, keeping the bathrooms clean. We currently have a cleaning crew that takes care of our maker space once a week. And I imagine, you know, we would just expand their role in our, in our program. Uh, along with, you know, me at the end of the day, every day walking through all the rooms and taking a look, you know, because that's how it goes. I just wanted to clarify too, there's not a conflict right between the PTO needs and... No, I, I don't think so, no. That didn't sound like it, I just wanted to make sure. Well, that was one of my questions. She talks about rooms five and six. What are the two that you're looking at? Uh, it's Hartman Hall's room one, uh, two and three. Two and three would be the room, so yeah. I mean, the five is is that room that's already been set up for that you know that yeah. play area, yeah. and I would say leave that alone. Um, yeah, so I don't I don't have there's no interest in that space for me there. Jim, have you ever thought? I mean, this is kind of unrelated, but yeah, we were talking about you know the five hundred one c three and some of the stuff that you do. Have you ever thought about opening up to school groups to come do a field trip for some? something absolutely that sounds I mean it'd be yeah. interesting to think about Ohio unified students you know I mean I know our fourth graders go to um, Forest home for uh, gold rush you know maybe oh there's what? A second grade that comes up and does keep it in-house it's an old alma mater um, yeah I, I think that would be great and we're open to exploring it in fact next year we're doing a program called branching out which is modeled uh, on a public program um, in Grand Rapids Michigan or no, Iowa, Iowa, I'm sorry, Grand Rapids, Iowa, that is about, you know, being out in kind of intern model for junior high and high school kids a little more in the community and community coming in and doing those things. So we, our whole idea is to have the, the school be a little more open-walled, right, a little more with the community. There's so many valuable learning experiences. So, yeah, we'd love to have the kids come up and see us, you know, that would open the walls, you know, continue to open the walls of the other schools as well. Yeah, that's that'd be great. We could we've got an outdoor person who does all kinds of stuff. Can the kids do archery? <laughs> we'll talk. <laughs> oh, we could do that's some gold rush. rush. Yeah. That was my first thing. I was a fourth grade teacher in my student teaching, and we did a huge gold rush unit. That was a good time. I was a gold blind Bailey. Was my character. <laughs> that's how it goes. Anyone else? I would like to go back to the point on calendaring. Yes. I think it will be important to Huge important. make sure that the calendaring is done. But I'm not sure the right way to do it. So I think that's something you, know, you should look at, Andy, and make sure that Absolutely. maybe we, maybe we can all yeah, meet. That you can all meet. Yeah. I, I just, chances are there will never be an issue, but I just want to make sure it's fair. It's very important to us. We, um, we have our calendar for the whole year pretty much already laid out. So that can be a document that we share with these other groups and say, these, these are our hopes. This is what we've got <coughs> booked already as a Google Doc. And then, you know, then if, if there's something that doesn't work, then maybe we can negotiate or compromise. Absolutely. Yeah, I would just uh, like to say, you know, I think it's great that for this coming year, at right. least during the school year, there is this this uh, sort of solidarity up yes. there at uh, Summit. I think it's awesome that the school will be vibrant and, and active and all of these different activities will be going on up there. Um, and, um, and so, you know, what, of, of the different uh, possibilities, save Summit continuing as a school this year, seems right. like a pretty good one. Nobody wants to see it empty. I know you guys don't. Nobody does. So absolutely, you know. Yeah. Thanks, Kevin. Um, is everyone ready to take action? Mm -hmm. I have a couple of questions actually. Um, 
and it's basically some of these terms. So the 1200 a month is clear. Uh, I'm not sure what assist with maintaining the grounds means. Uh, and it just says assist with grounds maintenance. So mm -hmm. what's, your, what's your understanding of what that means? Well, Andy and I haven't sat down to look at you. You've got that huge field, right, in that four acres. Um, and so we'd have to talk about that. I saw somebody was out there mowing it today with it's one of the Oh, <laughs> great. Yeah. Great. He just Is that in like blue and gas? He mowed the soccer field, the lower part. Yeah, yeah. And then it started spewing steam. So Bummer. It was was that a local or was that a school OUSD district. school district? Um, you know, I'm willing to discuss the details and figure out the details of that. It is, you know, those occasional maintenance uh, for like the weed abatement pieces seem really big. The other stuff seems pretty easy, you know, like the general. Uh, you know, we we fantasize about the um, that beautiful front area that you guys had installed. It needs needs to be it needs a little TLC. That's all stuff that's within you know what we want to be doing with our kids too and offering and the parents that are coming up and volunteering. So I think we can handle that piece. Those big pieces I'd want to talk to Andy about. You know I don't have direct access to a, a swather. Is that what those things are? Swathers. That's what so I'd like a little bit of specificity okay. on that. Okay. And I don't necessarily don't need it that. tonight, but I right. think it, the okay. specificity is important to avoid misunderstandings both with the community and the Absolutely. Um, well, and it's my understanding that if nothing was going on there, we would still be having to do that. I mean, if the, if the campus was empty. Yeah, I just would like to know what this means and what the commitment is for Rock Tree Sky um, because it has an effect on what the rent is. Correct. Um, so my other question is, I heard you saying something about building maintenance, but this says we'll be responsible for all building maintenance. That's right. So Separate from custodial. So custodial, they're yeah. taking care of for their okay. uses. Got building right. maintenance that's, is in if a roof starts leaking. Stuff. Precisely. Right. We would right. just trust you to do the roof. <laughs> I've learned a lot as a homeowner, Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> well, could you build us a sample classroom and then, then we'll know for sure. Um, and yeah, that was, those were the only two, really. Okay. 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 So I'll move to approve the agreement between Rock Tree Sky and the district for the 2018-19 school year. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 August 14th came and oh. here we are. <laughs> Thank you guys. All right. Thank you. We'll talk tomorrow, Jim. <laughs> Thanks. Right, sounds good. And we'll, we'll take our leave. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. We, we understand you sometimes come for specific reasons, so you're <laughs> welcome to leave. Although we're having a really interesting presentation from the mm -hmm. other Greg Grant. There are two <laughs> Greg Grants here on the uh, ATP, the Axper, uh, Active tra uh, Transportation Project. The, the Maricopa Highway bike. Oh. <laughs> 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 Thank you so much. See you later. Thank you. So we go to uh, 6.2 Active Transportation Program and Greg Grant. Greg, we've got the uh, clicker for you right up um, at the podium. Okay. Terrific. Well, good evening to the board and uh, appreciate the invite to come and present the project. And uh, I would like to introduce Paul Crabtree. He's a consultant that uh, lives locally and is very experienced with, I guess you might call it new urbanism or uh, all these complete streets concepts. He's been uh, traveled worldwide doing all kinds of crazy projects. Uh, so he's got great experience. We're lucky to have him here in town. He's a great influence on us. So uh, we'll, if there's questions from for Paul or I would be glad to take them anytime during the presentation or afterwards as well. Cool. And I guess I want to say hi. Is this Greg Grant? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's so we were, you know, we're not going to tell you which one, but we were really disappointed that one of you wasn't the other one. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, an absolutely quick side story is that uh, I had a, a review from my boss, the city manager, and uh, the morning of the review, which I never get, it's unusual, I mean, not that it's a negative anyway, but uh, he gave me a review, and that morning I got a couple of texts, sorry to hear you're leaving, <laughs> great knowing you were there, and I have no idea what the heck they're talking about, and I'm looking at it, and uh, I finally that evening, it, uh, we had a, a quick photo shoot with OVN for the new photos on the trolley, and uh, 
the reporter said, hey, uh, we figured it out. There's a, another Greg Grant <laughs> <laughs> construction background. <laughs> so, so that was hilarious. I've never met a Greg Grant. It can't be done in common, but I've never met one. So it's uh, unusual. <laughs> Well, let me uh, try to move through this quickly. I guess uh, I, I just want to keep it to kind of a brief 10-minute overview. And uh, I guess, uh, Andy, I think you just, you know, I'm not sure how do I advance slides oh, if I want to. Uh, the clicker should be right oh, by right, your hand. Oh, right, right, okay, all right. Okay, great. And uh, I guess I'll run through this. And I don't know, I, I had a quick, uh, letter that I'm not sure if people were able to take a look at or not. Mm -hmm. It's got similar information, but uh, a little different perspective here. So the ATP project not is the City of Ojai project. Is the clicker not working? Uh, would I click right, right? Yep. Let me try another button. Greg, do you mind popping it, it back? Just just it on, the side. on the side of it, is it but on? Oh, yeah, maybe places. this. That's true. That's true. Uh, well, oh, right. I'll, I'll All right. Okay. Try pointing toward where Javier is, see if it was an issue of direction. So okay. it's kind of... Maybe you uh, can pull it out a little, Javier. Javier will if help. you just point that way, then Javier will change. Yeah. <laughs> oh, right. I'll just give you the... All right. I'll give you the, old, the finger, the old staff. Well, uh, so active, ATP is a term, an acronym we use. It's Active Transportation Program. It's, uh, it's a combination of state and federal fundings doesn't mean much to most, but it means it gets more complicated for us because we have uh, state and federal agencies to get approving, uh, approvals through. For instance, environmental approvals have to go through CEQA and NEPA, and we have to go through uh, the California Transportation Commission, not Caltrans, for all kinds of approvals we're doing. So it is a $2.8 million grant to improve pedestrian and bike safety on both Maricopa and on Ojai Avenue. Uh, it's primarily pedestrian crosswalk improvements, bike lanes, and sidewalk and tree infill. So uh, you can kind of imagine that uh, all the crosswalks that we have and some additional crosswalks proposed will be looking at things like curb extensions, flashing beacons, and those kind of things to improve the safety of those crosswalks. And uh, Hey, Greg, just a quick one. I, I, I know we talked for a while about that uh, flashing and, and more safety across Maricopa to get it uh, back and forth from uh, Nordoff? Right. Is that part of this or is that a separate project? Putting flashing beacons on the existing four crosswalks in Maricopa was a separate grant. Got it. And we've had that embarrassingly in, it's part of the difficulty of uh, not owning the right of way. It's been Caltrans review for uh, almost two years now. In fact, we just, we, we in the interim, we submitted Kenyatta, Blanche, and, uh, and Park for flashing beacons. We've already got the permits for those. Those are being bid out right now. And uh, it just seems to be a little hang ups. There's little wacky things that go on with those for a while. There's patent infringements on those flashing beacon bars and they banned them and now they've re-allowed them. So we had to put permits and so on. It goes on forever. Uh, so, but back to this grant is really to improve the pedestrian crosswalks, uh, provide bike lanes for all of Ojai Avenue, from out of Gridley all the way to the Y, and then for uh, separated bike lanes for all of Maricopa Highway. And then wherever there's sidewalk gaps or tree gaps, uh, commonly called infill, uh, we'll, we'll complete those sidewalks and those tree gaps. Uh, and then the schedule is two years to design a permit, which we haven't quite started. This was all preliminary work up to this point. And we're hoping to get full funding for significant design work to get it done in two years. And through Caltrans, like we're saying, just those flashing beacons, we haven't gotten that two years. And uh, so we really need to push that. So, uh, so key points for pedestrian improvements are if we provide curb extensions, and we just completed the ones at Whispering Oaks you might have seen out there. And those are curb extensions. That's the maximum allowed by Caltrans to push it out uh, close to the edge of the parking lane. But it does allow the flashing beacons and the signers to come out in the roadway. So instead of being in the cross, in the sidewalk or behind the sidewalk, now you're pushing it out in the street. And it, everybody's busy and you're in your car and you're moving along and it's just some way to say, hey, this isn't just another stretch of highway. This is a point where we've got, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that goes on there, right? You've got legends and markings in the street as well as the signage now that pushes it out and makes it uh, significant to the, the car driver. Okay. Uh, 
question about the flashing stuff. I mean, you know, I've, I've had conversations with folks about the different types, right? Right. And a lot of there's a lot of people whose opinions are that the flashing in the crosswalk itself is actually more effective than having to look someplace where the pedestrians are not right. to see the flashing light. But my assumption is that Caltrans has to be less anything that we put in the street itself. Is that some of, with, am I wrong? I mean, Ohio Avenue is otherwise known as State Route 50, so they own the right of way. And Maricopa is otherwise known as State Route 33, owned by Caltrans. So everything we do in those right of ways is their property. We need to go through Anything that. that we would actually do in the street just complicates the job. Exactly. A yeah, a lot. Okay. Yeah, we could easily have this job well done by now, but it's, uh, extensive, uh, even they've handled environmental and things, which is sort of advantageous. So, uh, and, and there is quite a debate about that. The in-road, we've had them before, they get abused by rocks and tires, truck tires, they get beat up. They're, they're improving all the time, and there's a lot of issues, even that at nighttime, you still, the LEDs are so intense now, sometimes you still can't see the pedestrian. So the cost for installation and maintenance goes way up, and there's, uh, the actual benefits are questionable versus the flashing sides, yeah. Thank you. So. And then we've got uh, the bike improvements, I was mentioned, separated on Maricopa and bike lanes from the Y all the way up to Gridley. And then, uh, and, it, and this is really, I was looking at modifying this for the school board and really everything we've highlighted before is really no changes. I underlined some of this, it was relevant to OUSD and I realized that it's uh, hmm lined up it's a safe route to school this whole project is really about safe routes to school i mean it's uh, you can focus on nordoff area out there which is a key part of it but there's kids going back and forth in all directions and this is a great alternative to the bike trail or shorter routes if you're just trying to get from matillaha over to nordoff there's a few ways to do it but one will be a safe route from ojai avenue cutting over to maricopa so this is really helpful and a great way for kids to get to school from school and just be more active in general. So the, the proposal here is to take the two lanes and take it down to one lane for cars. On Maricopa. And trucks. Yes. Up to El Roblar and then past El Roblar back to, well, I guess it passed El Roblar. It's already one. one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. No, I just want to clarify because, I mean, there are a lot of times where I mean, especially football games, activities where both lanes are packed with cars. Well, keep in mind, there's no, there'll be actually more parking right now, I think it technically. No, I'm not talking about parking, I'm talking yeah. about vehicular movement. Down right. The, the biggest issue that uh, most traffic engineers will emphasize is when you have a street that doesn't need that kind of volume, it promotes speeding. So you've really got the volumes that are on that Maricopa Highway that are approximately half the volume of Ojai Avenue. So Ojai Avenue already has tw twice the volume, and it can get a little congested Thursday through into weekends during peaks. Oh, it's crazy congested. I mean, it's, <laughs> it, keep in mind, it's not related to the capacity of the street. That's more related to stops and uh, people turning and pedestrians, the stuff you won't see out there. So it's half the volume. Well, and the volume of traffic. Right, so the volume's less than half over here, and you've got this area that promotes speeding. So you have people obeying and being careful for crosswalks and pedestrians, and you're essentially creating a passing lane. You might have heard this come up for Oakview. Oakview, they've got a, a big grant to look at revising that because they have issues with people using the right lane of those two lanes as a passing lane to get up three cars and get back in line with the rest of the traffic, right? So, so uh, yeah. They, but I'm just wondering, like, when parents are dropping kids off at school, and they want to turn into the campus. So right now, you get a lineup of cars in the one lane, and then the other lane allows cars that just want to keep going and don't want to do anything with the school. And we're being very careful about that because all of the congestion that we have on Maricopa occurs for 10 or 15 minutes in the morning when the school drop off and during the school pick up in the afternoon for 10 or 15 minutes. It's very brief. And it's really all about like you're saying, that right-hand turn lane, when it stacks back and kicks in and blocks the street a little well, bit. On the left so hand turn lane. longer turn lane. It, both, the left and the right, going into that same parking lot. Yeah, so if you're heading. So now, cars are just gonna back up forever. We're gonna make sure we have an extended right-hand turn lane as you're coming from the Miners Oaks area, and then we're looking at extending the left-hand turn lane against the median that's causing that as well. Like how much longer? Well, I think right now it's about 150, and we're looking at another 50 feet. And I would add that 
with a nice safe crosswalk there with lights, you would be more likely to take a right if, as you're going towards Myers Oaks with your back to the south, you know, with that big long left lane you're talking about. Take a right turn and let your kid walk across the street. We're also looking at a drop off zone on it. It's, it just goes somewhat across, across. You know, you've got the area in front of the high schools, your drop off zone will be maintained, but also on the opposite side. But a lot of people do drop their kids off on the other side. That church. Some, Some aren't, don't feel very safe about it because of the crosswalks or yeah. safety issues. No, I think they, I think having bright lights and great crosswalks, I, that's fantastic. And I think making bike lanes more clear and safe is great. I just, I've been, I've been in traffic there a lot, even with the two lanes. Yeah, just keep in mind that half the volume with one lane is what we have right now on Ojai Avenue. Uh, I'm sorry, we have. I should say twice the volume here with one lane. So you've got the proposals to have one lane as well, but it, we don't change the volume, it's still half. And it only really that pinch point is morning and afternoon for school. You don't see any other congestion out there. And I think we're also trying to work with the school, and I think uh, superintendent's very open to it, is uh, to promote a better flow in the parking lot. The parking lot's got a lot of room for improvement to it Definitely backs up. That's what's causing that backup out into yeah. the street. Yeah. You'll find as people use. Yeah, I can't think of a worse flow. <laughs> <laughs> we can sit around and draw some things out, but I don't know if we'll come up. With more. So we'll have we'll have improvements <laughs> for that as well as when people use the pedestrian crosswalk, that creates a pulse for the cars to stop, which allows the left-hand turn lane to be used. You're talking about there. A lot of it is that left turn lane is not being used right now because traffic keeps flowing in there. Right, because there's a second lane. Like you can go at one point, but the second lane yeah. has a car. So you Nobody, have to wait. Certain people so are timid about it. Yep, yeah. delay it. So I think all this you'll see significant improvements. We've got uh, good improvements planned. The, uh, there are stormwater. We're in an extended drought of concern, and we're looking at uh, pervious pavement sections as well as uh, uh, stormwater capture in the curb extensions. And we're looking at is the side of shoe, the adding parking down in. Ohio Avenue in some places it was removed across from uh, West Ridge and a couple areas down Greg, what does pervious mean? Uh, pervious means permeable. Okay, so basically just putting the water back into the right. aquifer? Right. You can do it in pavement or you can do it in capture areas where you put uh, dry wells and other things to get As through the aquifer. As opposed to sending it straight out to the ocean? Exactly, yeah. So we're trying to refill the aquifer as much as possible. Cool. Yeah. Uh, so back to benefits, uh, improved safety, aesthetics. It, these conditions, as you can imagine, there's communities that have brought back the downtown and it improves business in areas. People slow down and see businesses and feel more comfortable visiting. Uh, for cars, these curb extensions, you'll have people concerned about them. But for cars, it actually reduces the amount of time. Instead of a curb set way back where you have to wait for a pedestrian to step off and cross all the way over here, now you push out the curb extensions and you've got a short distance. It's more prominent, you see them, it's safer and it's quicker for the cars as well as safer for the pedestrian. I, ha I do have to say, so I have, I have a business on Fulton Street, and those extensions come out so far that two cars don't feel like they can pass, so you have to stop wait. and wait for a car and then go through. So right. just make sure that the extension, I mean, really, is that every car, when there's two cars, you stop uh. and let them go or you go because the, the curb extensions are so... And that Fulton Street yeah. extension, yeah, there's... At the bike path. I think that's got 24 feet between those curb extensions. So it's two 12-foot lanes, which is the same as a freeway lane. But it's on an angle there, so it makes it tricky. Or maybe they just need to put a lot of, like, some A center line. line. So you oh, yeah. But the other part is the bike trail is used heavily, and it's good to slow down and be careful there. I mean, the a number of times you actually have two cars crossing at the bike trail is highly unusual. So if you have to wait for a second, it might delay you. I'm just saying you don't want that on Ohio Avenue. Or uh, for good or bad on Ohio Avenue, and we, we don't have control. Caltrans required curb extensions to be pulled way back to the point they're behind the parking lane, which means that sometimes you don't even see them behind parked cars, which is not ideal, but it's no impediment whatsoever. <laughs> so that's good in that way. Because there is another spot where the streets aren't exactly perpendicular, and the bulb comes out, and you have to really drive out into the other lane in order to get around the pole because the streets aren't, I mean, it's just Are you thinking of a, new, a recent one we put in? Yeah. Uh, Bristol, maybe? Um, Bristol. Bristol, That's yep. the one. 
Bristol, the contractor isn't quite finished. They're going to add a center line to guide stripe. But at the same time, but that's when you're coming down Bristol, you have you really have to drive out of your way to get around the ball. Yeah, and and that one I know, for instance, is 28 feet between curb extensions, so it's a lot of room. But uh, you need that one used to be very a big concern for pedestrians and bikes, and now it's improved significantly. So you got to slow down. And I did a lot of work there. We stood in the middle of the street, always discussing things. It was never dangerous. There was kind of unusual to see much traffic at all. Right. I, I don't know what you mean by improved. Yeah. You said it's much improved. I don't Oh, much yeah. improved from before when there's no curb extensions? Yeah. How do you define when you pull improved? Safety. Yeah. We're like, was walkers. anybody ever hurt there? Greg, um, part of it is prioritization. So um, for the last 50 years, we've been prioritizing the automobile. Mm -hmm. And the bikes and pedestrians have been suffering because of it. And so what, what we're trying to do is sort of shift the needle a little bit so that um, pedestrians are sort of on an equal level with, with the automobiles. So but in some of these places, I don't know what suffering means. Well, for I mean, instance, the was one- Was anybody ever hurt at that intersection? You know, it's close calls we've world. had, I mean, about a year and a half ago, someone was killed in the crosswalk here. But not that one. So right. That, I mean, that's the point. But that one I've walked one. through many times, thing, and and it is. It's a scary spot, especially when you have kids in tow. It was a scary spot to cross that that bike trail. Right. No, I'm not saying that something shouldn't be done. I think there are ways to promote safety. It's just. Yeah. Creating a barrier for I mean, for example, on on some of these, reducing two lanes to one lane, uh, several places in LA did that. And there was such an uproar, they had to spend millions of dollars to tear it out. I think you're talking about one good case that everybody refers to. One out of hundreds, yeah. But it was the one you're talking about uh, near the airport, right? Yeah. I'm not. So. Right, right. So I, we're, we're being extremely careful. Luckily, maybe luckily, is Caltrans is right of way. They were two years trying to put in flashing beacons on existing crosswalks for ridiculous. <laughs> so it goes down to LA and there's six departments that review it for three to four months and give us back and give us our four weeks to get it back to them. I'm all for safety. Yeah. I'm all for these things. I want the kids to be safe. I want to be able to walk and ride a bike and yeah. do all those things. I just, I think sometimes we go overboard and then we get left with something that doesn't really work. So, and to try to not beleaguer the Bristol too much, but before it used to be when you walked up or biked up to it, it was very easy to sweep that corner. There was a huge wide opening and a lot, and it, not all cars, but some cars came through quickly and it was very hard to signal and feel safe. So now it's kicked out and cars have to slow down a little bit, not much. I don't think it's creating any traffic jam. It could delay on a rare occasion when two cars meet there, might delay people's seconds, right? Oh, I, so. I just, I, I think there's a better chance that there will be a car accident there someday. Mm -hmm. Somebody running over the sidewalk. Right. Because so, it is right in the middle of the street. Yeah, if somebody takes out a wheel on a tire, if they're that fast or that careless, well. Well, at night yeah. when it's dark, <laughs> you don't yeah. have to go fast. I think you'll see we've, uh, so when we finish the scribe, I don't want to continue. If you don't mind, this. I think yeah. we, we could get more because this is talking about it that's not part of this. Right. Curb extensions. <laughs> okay. Right. And then, uh, <laughs> so to kind of, it, it is, it's, but as, as uh, Paul's mentioned, the, uh, the pendulum is swinging back. You'll see nationwide. And I was uh, somewhat lucky enough to just go on a European vacation with my kids and during the heat wave a few weeks ago. And uh, it's crazy hot and humid, but still, it was interesting to see the uh, how you know narrow streets and uh, traffic control that they've been doing for a long time, especially in France and you see it in Spain and Italy. They they've had uh, all kinds of the crosswalks very common there to kick their crosswalk up six inches, and make it a table, so it's basically a speed hump at the crosswalks, and people know that's all around town. Don't speed through crosswalks. Pinch roads put chicanes kicking the roads back and forth, making sure people don't zip through in little European cars and, and hurt pedestrians. So I think we've uh, had a lot of close calls and unfortunately, I hate to say, a few deaths around here. And uh, nobody wants to see that for uh, an absolutely minimal cost, I think you'd see for vehicles. And there have been deaths at the spots that we're talking about specifically, in front of the high school and 
downtown. Maricopa, downtown, out at Whispering yeah. Oaks, yeah, all the locations. Yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, well, just uh, to try to keep, I'll try to move quickly to save my 10 minute gap if I can. <laughs> but this, this is kind of a quick visual of it. You can see the yellow portion being the Maricopa Highway, and you can see there's numbers there, not very well, but that was the project overview uh, for numbered crosswalks that are being improved. Uh, we're adding sidewalks from the Y to downtown, which will be carefully placed to avoid damaging the oak trees, the DG and so on. And out in front of uh, the ranch, Rancho Wind, you know, from Country Club downtown and all the way out. Nice. And, uh, and a little bit of close up, same thing showing that. And this, for those interested parties, there's a website at the end that shows detailed, more detailed concept designs for each of these sections. With sheet two, there's an alternative we've worked on with the bike advocates, and uh, I'll mention that in a minute. And uh, so here we are out at Maricopa at El Roblar, and it shows the kind of concept we've got so far. You can see when you come from Miner's Oaks in the upper left, and uh, I don't know if there's much of a pointer there or not, but uh, does this have a, oh, I see it as a pointer, okay. So coming from El Roblar and going down, where there was two lanes, we'll have it kick into a separated, what they call a class four bike lane down here. This green will be trees interspersed between uh, parking. And then you've got your main traffic lane, which will go through there. So these are separated class four bike lanes, which are what people feel the safest with. You know, you feel comfortable going with your family out on a lane like that, feeling fully protected. Uh, there's some people that will do things like flexible barriers and so on, which are less safe, but this is intended to be a fully separated, uh, safe uh, approach where you'll, I think you'll see the ridership to school, parents pushing it, increase. Uh, and here's a rendering which shows it nicely too, right? There's the median as exists now. Here's the existing bike, the existing vehicle lane. Here's the vehicle lane that will eliminate and put in parking. Uh, we'll work with Caltrans on exactly what the tree spacing is. This one shows a rendering with it fairly tight. <laughs> It'll be more space than that. And then we've got the bike lane against the existing curb with the existing sidewalk. So you can imagine once you put these trees in, uh, there's a term that uh, it's called a walk appeal. And it's uh, more appealing when, you know, you've got to walk from Miner's Oaks area and you walk on that open sidewalk section. It's cooking hot through a lot of days. In the afternoon so suddenly you've got shade and it feels comfortable to bike at a reasonable pace or walk through in that shaded area so it'll be a major benefit Greg, you know this oh, is nothing you, you um, go back you know we, we have no say in, in this part this is all city but when you mentioned that it's like oh yeah you don't want people to have to parallel park there you want them to be able to just pull right. Them, right and that's why the tree spacing this rendering is tight but it really won't be that tight it'll probably be uh, something in the realm of uh, one to three or so for this to allow two to three cars park in there. It's really what during <coughs> football games July 4th and graduation and some special events maybe. So uh, roughly, I don't know, a dozen times a year or so. Yeah. So it's not a lot. So we don't want to overemphasize, but we want to make sure we maintain that parking availability. Yeah, I'm just curious how much there will be compared to what there is now, because now at all those events you talked about, there's parking almost all the way down the road, mm -hmm. and but more people might bike and walk. Right. I would. My guess. Or I wouldn't. Have. I think that's really optimistic. I would too. Honestly. We got two. We got <laughs> I mean, and families. I mean, look, the, the, the reality is, right, that this is an attempt to sort of refocus <clears throat> people on active transportation. I mean, it's not just, hey, you know, as we do it now, everybody drives everywhere. What happens then? It's, hey, let's maybe migrate a little to more active transportation. Plus the safety. I, Greg knows. I, I went to Greg uh, several years ago when Jim was maybe a freshman because we had a really close call in that Maricopa where he's, as Greg says, people just haul and they, and that, that little crosswalk was just, I was like, wow, I, you know, he's a smart kid, but I was like, you got to be really careful because you don't see those cars. I think calming, I, yeah, personally, I think it's great. 
Yeah, the difference between a close call and serious injury with the pedestrian versus the car is just that close, yeah. Well, that's where Dr. Favre's kid was killed, too. Dr. Favre. Favre, sorry. Teddy Favre, yeah. Right. So that concept, but for sure we are be aware, very aware of that in the parking space and count and so on is very important to us. And uh, we, we will, I mean, even the bike trail from downtown in both directions right now. It's a little tricky coming across the Y. We have significant improvements proposed out there as well. So you should be able to feel comfortable taking the bike trail and getting on to Maricopa and getting out to the school. So I think you'll see, we've got counts and we'll be tracking all the improvements as they occur. How that is a really hard transition for, for bikes. Across the Y, right. So we'll have significant improvement on that, yeah. And I don't think we're going to get into this, but it just shows for interested parties, some people will love to get into it. And you've got cross sections and more detailed concepts at this time. You can see that parking area is proposed as pervious paving, and that's where all that water that sheds off would infiltrate and return to groundwater. And so these sections here, uh, these the concepts you can see, uh, I think we were talking as you pull up, and this is the primary entrance to the school, and it, a lot of it clogs up here in the parking lot, and it backs up that right-hand turn lane. The left-hand turn lane backs up, but as I watched it, it's unusual, but occasionally it kicks in and blocks that lane a little bit, and that's where we're looking at extending this left-hand turn pocket, and we're also looking with the improved pedestrian crosswalk, we should see the traffic pulse a little more. So when, tra when uh, students are coming across here, it allows traffic to pulse in. We also looked at improving, right now it's one lane in, one lane out. We're looking at widening that curb cut so you get two out, one in. Because a lot of times you get traffic stacked in the one exit and it, if they want to go left, they're holding up that lane. If you get one dedicated right, that will keep things flowing there as well. So between various proposed improvements, uh, I think it will help a lot in front of the school. And we'll still have, it will transition from that separated class four bike lane. It kicks over to allow the right hand turn here and here it stays out as a bike lane which allows cars to cross and pull up front you won't have many people using that bike lane during loading or unloading at beginning end of school so that allow everybody to park in front of the school like they do right now it the, seems like that's when the bikes would be there kids riding to school Not right going past the school though. oh right because the bike yeah. Over on the side. This will allow kids coming this way. We're actually looking at, at dedicating a little turn off here for the bikes that can cut in so they don't congest with the car traffic here. Mm -hmm. So all the bikes should spill off here and the bikes coming up this way will have options, but most of them would more like, likely use a pedestrian crosswalk there. But then they have to go all the way across the parking lot with their bike? They would, uh, I don't exactly Isn't know. The bike area the, over on the side? Presumably they'd be coming on bikes this way mm -hmm. and they'd come up and they'd it's use the crosswalk and come into school. They could stay on the bike lane and go with cars like some of the more, uh, you know, dominant bikers, I guess, would want to use the left-hand turn lane just like cars. There is... You were saying the bike corral is further... That's what I thought, but it sounds like I'm wrong. I it's thought it was back down the driveway, but maybe... Right behind F next to where our dumpster buildings are. Oh, okay. Over here, Rob? Yeah. Okay. Right where the tree is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you see a lot of kids. Really, the reality is this bike lane going that way won't be used. So not that I'm promoting it or that's legal, but a lot of kids are going to cross over early and use that bike lane as a safe location to ride up and cut into the parking lot. They'll do what they want. <laughs> so, uh, Greg, so Greg, one thing I'll tell you is when, when people are both stacked up uh, from Minor Oaks taking that right turn into Nordoff as well as taking the left, the biggest problem there is that, is that effectively there's an endless line of people taking a right and they have to occasionally let somebody in to take a left. If there was some early, you know, if the left turners could turn into an earlier left, you know, if there was another gap that they could turn into something that was almost exclusive to them, or if potentially in the morning the high school could just make that all one direction so that you could take a left into Nordoff and the other people could also be taking right at the same time, but it's just, it's a really, really you're talking, badly. Are talking about instead of turning left here, somebody being able to turn left on that No, right? maybe just a little, maybe a little bit, maybe like. Yeah, you can almost, you're saying, I think you mentioned that, yeah. you're just going to have two in oh, and one out like in the morning. This, we're all in, yeah. these guys are going like, I want to go in, and I'm going in, and so you just have politely waiting for someone to let you go. 
go, and then you go in and you go in, and there's this whole gap, there's nothing going on, either that, or, like if, if another in lane here, so these guys can go in here, and these guys can go in here, because it, it just, that's, this gets so long, because you're waiting, there's an endless number of people taking a right turn. Or left turn, right? In that case. right no, but you're waiting on all these people taking a right, they have the right away. Oh, right, right. So uh -huh. you just have to wait for them to let you go. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, might be something we look at with the three lanes that's more readily available, the minor adjustment. We could have in the morning two in, one out, and we could have evening uh, two out, one in. Yeah, maybe it would do yeah. on the freeways. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and it, on the freeways. Some people actually do traffic control. That is, would have been easy on city, but on Caltrans you can do uh, have a traffic guide out there that just lets traffic flow. Mm -hmm. But I, when I noticed it, it's it, pretty unusual for it to kick out and block that lane. But little surges of it based on when, how often I get to turn left, how often a pedestrian or somebody lets them pulse through. But, but we'll uh, appreciate that. It's a good point to try to really focus because that it is seems like 15 minutes, 10 to 15, morning, evening, and afternoon, afternoon, let out. I think and you it's a good have idea, but I think I worry about teenage drivers getting confused. No, mm. but once you know, I, last year I came over to the was just on the first day of school. And just you know, directing and once once parents get it or once people get it, I'm sure it was it becomes second it becomes nature. Kind of, you know, I mean, maybe you'd have to do it for a week because it's so new or something. But we were just trying to accommodate maybe parents who are new to Matella, like where's the bu where's the bus lane, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I think if you just did that for the first two days, school, I don't. Well, we'll take a good look at that. We've got a lot of great people, Paul, regional people, and other pros looking at this project. So. Uh, Maybe a consideration for what you know they call a hot crossing is where you actually stop the traffic for pedestrians, kind of like in Casita Springs. So then you get a red light that goes to a pulse and it locks it off, and then they know they can turn as long as they don't cross that walkway. You know, same kind of thing. There's a there's a few options that we can look at, but I think uh, you can also see in this one that you can see proposed curb extensions here, and here, and also up here, providing for area to pull in here, as well as afterwards. But it also, and the, the bike advocates are very, uh, there's some bike advocates in, that are concerned. They would like to maintain the class four bike lane all the way through here, which is an option we've proposed. It's not shown here, but uh, that would keep it tight to the curb. And then you land up with the uh, stopping zone being on the other side of the bike lane, the, the class four bike lane. So Could that, you explain that again? Well, uh, right now we're going, uh, Transition on Maricopa is to go from a class four bike lane from El Roblar over to here. Right, meaning meaning like a separate bike lane. Separated bike lane. And then when you go to from this point from the high school over the Y, it's a more traditional bike lane where the bike lane is adjacent or next to. It's still buffered because we have right. enough room that it's not a small stripe, but that line right there is extra wide. I think it was about three foot wide of a cross striped area. So that is not as safe as a separated. So some of the bike advocates would like to see this class four continued all the way out to the Y. Why is it not on this parking? The issue with that becomes when it's busy with a lot of driveway cuts, which we have more of, and uh, more street intersections, it becomes tricky. You start chopping up uh, curb extensions like you can see right here. Uh, but also all the, you can imagine pulling out of a driveway. Now you've got to look at a, a bike lane first, pull out to an island and wait. You might be blocking the bike lane, and uh, it can be a little more complicated for a driver to leave the yeah, driveway. Too many driveways from there. Right. But we're looking at that carefully. We've got an alternate design, and we'll work with Caltrans. We might, if there's a way to eliminate curb cuts and so on, we would go towards that. So uh, the next slide, yeah, thanks. And that was just a close up in case uh, people were interested here at. Right out front, I guess that's the things we were talking about. So to stop on the right side of the road, you would have to drive across the bike lane to park? Yes. On the other side? Oh, yes, both. Here, if you're going to do it, you pull across the bike lane and you, you uh, unload, load. Same thing here. And that's what's the class two bike lane. The alternate is to leave uh, separated, then you'd pull off adjacent to the traffic lane. There's two different options there. Go back a slide. I, I I just noticed the little that it, bike connection by OUSD. 
Right, and that was to allow bikes, instead of come up and to mingle with the cars, they right. would pull off direct. And I'm just wondering if that's part of the 2.8 million that would be covered by this. Is that, yes. did that come before the board? Because that is on OUSD property at that point. And so right. we'd have to, to have more detail on that. Yeah, I mean, all this project involves uh, permitting to the uh, ownership of the property, primarily Caltrans, but obviously that particular feature as well as Modifying the curb cut would need your support approval, as well as any, uh, we would provide proposals inside the parking lot if you're receptive. Okay. Might be interesting in to have a, a bike lane in the, in the parking lot mm -hmm. that goes along all the way to the mm -hmm. basketball gym. It'd be nice because we have these pros all available and we'll have nice aerial photographs with details on them like that when we uh, propose striping plans in the parking lot and so on. So. And this is this one shows that concept in a nice rendering. It's a little more easy to understand. Is the uh, median? Here's the traffic lane that exists. And now this is from the high school out to the Y. Now you got the bike lane next to the cars with a buffered. So it's improvement versus a tight one, but it's a buffered bike lane. And then you've got cars parking. Really, they don't park between the high school and the Y anyways. But we're talking about adding it in a visual aesthetic improvement, which provides shades for cars as well as. The, uh, the sidewalk, and uh, I guess the term you often hear is the uh, the urban heat island, and it's the fact that we've just created so much concrete and removed so many trees everywhere that everything's heating up, and it creates significant increased temperatures around urban areas. So it's a goal to try to return uh, trees and greenery so it cools the area a little bit too. And I think we all know when you go stand out, the kids will all love walking home on a shaded sidewalk or bike trail much more than getting cooking on the home. And uh, so here, uh, I think it's just to show, for instance, you know, in front of uh, the Ben Franklin uh, shopping area, you know, there's no sidewalk. So sidewalk infill include, include fixing that area, as well as around the corner, uh, you go around the Y between uh, the Weinberger Memorial Garden, as well as over to Del Norte, there's like a really poor sidewalk. So to improve all those sidewalks through there. These details won't sit on unless someone's interested. And, uh, but the alternate that the bike advocates were interested in was the uh, class four from the high school to the Y and uh, some other minor improvements in the Y where we pull the bike lanes back into those lawn areas instead of out closer to the sidewalks. If uh, anybody wants to see those concepts or the alternates, they're on, you just basically go to the city's website under public works and you'll see uh, all the references to this project. Are those alternates going before the city council, or is it just this uh, project? It'll be uh, alternates to the city council, right? So it'll be like three choices, or two? Or yeah, the thing is that because it is Caltrans right of way, we've got a long ways to go to get this project approved. So we'll be proposing and dealing with Caltrans on it and negotiating what can get done. So what is the status? So this goes before the city council soon? Right. And then they approve it, and they recognize, just as Shelley pointed out, you're dealing, you know, of course, the school district would have to prove its part. Caltrans has to prove everything that it has to prove. Occasionally, you've got a property owner that has to prove something. But obviously, it wouldn't go anywhere if the city council didn't approve it. So you That's right, start yeah. there. They would say, pull, it, pull the funding. But uh, to proceed with the next phase is really to go through the hard design. It's about a two-year effort, working all this out, making sure we have right-of-way covered. and. Uh, Work, and then we have design exceptions when it gets narrower and there's tighter uh, from Caltrans standards and so on. So there's a long way to go there and uh, we hope that the council would approve the concept with the alternate and then let uh, staff proceed with uh, pursuing them and seeing what uh, was recommended by Caltrans. I time. would really like to see the street barricaded off to replicate what this would be like for a football game or two and morning traffic for a week? Just no, if it was on city right away, we'd do it next weekend. But uh, unfortunately, on Caltrans, we'll certainly appreciate that. It's a good idea. We always like to do that. Demonstrations would be ideal. And to, uh, yeah, okay, I appreciate that. We'll, I, I think uh, we probably could demonstrate that pickup football night. Uh, football games go through November, is that it? Yeah. Yeah, through November. I mean, this might be the most wonderful thing in the world, but I would like to work the bugs out right. before you spend all the money and make it permanent. Okay, appreciate that. We'll give that a shot. 
seems like it shouldn't be any great issue. We just put out barricades and close it to one lane yeah. while we maintain the parking. So yeah, all right, we'll try that. So I'll move through this pretty quickly. It's less relevant to Maricopa, which I'd imagine is your primary interest. But as I mentioned, this I think it helps all of your schools and in general, all of the students in general getting around to wherever they're going. So uh, you can see that yellow line is the new proposed sidewalk all across the existing oak trees, but we do a special surfacing material. We're not going to put concrete in. We'd use decomposed granite. We'd improve the uh, crossing at uh, access from the bike trail. You can see it comes up and it gets a dedicated bike lane that kicks it right over in the mm. bike. So proposals to have a, a switch for bikes, which will kick when they need it. Won't be that often, but it'll cycle through. And then uh, they can come over and get on the bike lane a couple of different approaches. So is there not, there's not a bike lane on Ojai Avenue? But, but there is on Ojai Avenue. I think a lot of people use Ojai Avenue, the more confident bikers, the people that are only going down, you know, if, if you're going from school and you just want to take this route to get over to Matilha Jr., you might take this route and kick up here would be preferable. But uh, if you're with family or have more time, you take the dedicated bike path. But uh, the whole Ojai Avenue will be used by a lot of people doing short distances. We've had a lot of questions. Well, why do you even need Ojai Avenue bike lanes if you've got the bike path? What's the point? Well, you've got to go further south and out of the way. So if you're just going a block or two or whatever, you might find it more that convenient. That was one of my questions. But then it occurred to me that the majority of our kids that live downtown are on the other side from the bike trail. Getting to, the, you know, for kids going to school, they're on the north side as opposed to the that's where my kids live. Right. right and that's where most of the kids live is up on the north side so it makes yeah sense. a lot of kids are going to come down <laughs> hit Ohio avenue for a block or two or three right. they're not going to want to make that extra move to get down onto right. the bike path yeah and a lot of people shopping whatever just in general use yeah so uh i think that shows that and there's the concept right we're just showing that uh now you've got the existing median that will maintain pretty much everywhere because it's used as emergency vehicle access and we'll have the vehicle lane that we have with a bike lane. So this one, curb to curb, we don't have the room we have out of Maricopa, so we, we can't put a buffer bike lane. It's a bike lane, and uh, it's not as safe as it would be separated or even the buffered bike lane, but it's a, an option for people to have. But it's still a step up from a share of Right, yes, absolutely. Well, it would be interesting because one of my concerns for Matilda is when you were downtown, you're coming out, let's say, by um, the, um, the hotel that's there. Oh, uh, the Oaks? The, the Oaks. Right. It, if you're turning right, this has happened to me twice, and so now I, I'm really... So you, you look for a pedestrian, you don't see one. You look for a car, there's not one coming, so you know you can go, because you're just turning right. In the time it takes you to turn and look for a car, maybe you've waited for a car, a bicycle is coming down on that side, and you start to go, and the bicycle is there. So I wonder if these lanes will actually encourage people to ride the right way, ride on the other side. I, I think you just brought out a great point. I appreciate that because I didn't highlight it here. Is when you're in an intersecting street onto Ojai Avenue, these bike lanes improve the line of sight significantly. Instead of cars hugging closer and the bikes hugging, it gets them out in a more prominent position. So the line of sight is improved when you do this kind of approach. Uh, okay, I think we won't stay on these. And I think this just in general to focus on, yep, it'll be the DG path, Country Club. And uh, then it'll be concrete proposed from Country Club Drive all the way down to Topa Topa. I'm sorry, that's Bristol. And even from Bristol down to Topa Topa. And then we've got them already from that point. I think we've got a new big picture. There's already a sidewalk on the north side, so there's not too much improvements on the north side. And here is, uh, I guess, the ex if you can go forward, I think that's probably a redundant. Yeah, this one is kind of a nice picture. just shows the concept here. Oh, I think this is right around the vet's office, right? People walk along through here, but now you put in a fog line that pushes traffic out. Like I'm saying, so when you're pulling out, you can see the cars out further, more prominently, and you get a dedicated bike lane and you get a dedicated walking path. So it should improve the general aesthetic appearances and safety of the whole area. That's a mess down there. So nice. And, uh, and as you go through downtown, uh, this has always been a problematic intersection, right? If you're trying to cross from uh, Kenyatta across 
El, El, El Paseo. You don't know if cars are going to go straight or not. They don't use a blinker to stay on the main road, so you never know what they're doing there. So we've got a significant improvement, a big bull nose put here, so cars will have to go up and slow and then turn into that on the unusual case they use it. We've got uh, flashing beacons just permitted the other day, so these will be going in. We'll have one, one an advanced notice beacon because people do zoom into town here. So that'll improve that. And we've got a, a neat uh, graphic too showing a median proposed here. We're working with the property owners in this area to assure it doesn't block view of the businesses and that kind of thing. So to have a nice marker to say you're in town, slow down, have breath, you know. And, uh, it, it's kind of a nice way to mark the entry to town when you put these kind of things. We're not going to continue it down here because of emergency vehicle access, but we'll have a strip of the median from here to the here. And then this still allows for the left-hand turn lane there. That's a nice rendering from the Crabtree group that uh, gives you better feel for it, right? If you're now going to walk up here, you're safe this way. And if you're going to get across this way, you've got an area this car is going to come up and turn through. And then you've got this uh, median with uh, trees or other vegetation uh, with this more prominent crosswalk. And now you've got a protected refuge. And, and this goes back to when cars come in, Right now, they have to stop from here when they step off the curb all the way to here. Now, the pedestrian, once they hit this curb, that's the end of the protected zone, they can proceed. So it actually increases the speed of the traffic stop for cars in these crosswalks. And uh, we're talking about, this is that same strip that there used to be parking some time ago here to return the parking out front, makes pedestrians feel safer, helps businesses out front, have people pull up in front and park. So we'll be looking at that. And uh, that's, let's see, I think there's one more. I think there's, could you, could, yeah, that's a nice rendering there. It just shows this idea, right? A curb extension to improve the safety for the pedestrian, the median, and the bike lane all combined. And there's parking there? There's room for that? Yeah. yeah. Is there room yeah. for parking too? Yeah. I know there's room right now, but when you add the bike path. Yeah, right. That's great. That'd be awesome. So that, uh, and that strip of median right for a short Look, zone. Kids who go to school. That's <laughs> <laughs> exactly what's going to look like. How many? <laughs> what was the con Somebody had a concern here. Yeah, no, it was. A, I guess about. Uh, I'm trying to think of the median. Yeah, but most people support. I think it'll be a terrific entry point to the city. Yeah. And these, uh, I think these graphics, most of the rest of these are just overly detailed for what you're probably interested in. But it shows the concept as you go through. This real narrow area occurs from the library to Montgomery, and you've got to have a share through town. There's not enough room to put in bike lanes. And, uh, but we do have curb extensions pro proposed in front of the new brewery. And, uh, and at the crosswalk in the middle of the arcade would have one as well, middle of Libby Park. And we may there preserve the uh, historic character we might look at doing in, in road flashing beacons, the more expensive approach, if anything. So you said there's not a designated bike lane in the downtown? Is that Cheryl, that's all we fit through that area. And then it kicks back out to a little wider in this area. Uh, okay. That's a nice, another rendering, just showing uh, even returning trees to downtown, right? That uh, these used to have, used to be trees in front of the arcade a long time ago. And uh, we'll be very careful working with the businesses that are concerned about you know, that can result in loss of parking, so we're being very careful to yeah, the trade off on that. On yeah. I don't see what the trade off is. Well, the trade off. You put a tree in and you park one less car. Well, I mean, it, the number of spaces you'll lose here are more than offset by that block we added on just uh, up in front of the museum, in front of uh, Jim and Rob's, and so on up there. You'll have kind of a, f I forget the factor, six fold increase in parking in this downtown area. But it also, uh, it's pretty hot down there. I mean, you go to Fourth of July Parade or whatever, you can't even hide inside the arcade. The sun cuts right through there. So, uh, I park in front of the district rather than downtown because it's hot and there's trees out here and there's not trees there. Right. It'll make Ojai Day better. <laughs> it'll, it'll be a better appearance, and I guess this is probably oh. some time ago. <laughs> but, uh, it's like got to be at least the 70s. <laughs> so. For all it might have been the 80s, but, was, you know, <laughs> but those big old oaks were out front, and uh, it's classic. There's another one that the museum was just using right here. I think that's a little bit older and so on, too, but there's all these trees out front. But I, 
I think we all, when we park, you try to park next to the tree. You try to get the shade, right, to help the car temperatures a little bit. So for aesthetics, but that certainly is a, a discussion item. I know a few businesses were concerned, too, the leaf litter might be a problem. Yeah. Do you see so. the way that car is parked? Is there room for that? Uh, yeah, it's uh, not leaving the median. No, if you leave, if you get rid of the median, you could go diagonal, a fairly sharp diagonal. But the median is fairly important for delivery as well as uh, yeah. emergency service. And I think these details are probably not too critical. And just to give you a concept, you should go out here. Same thing in front of, uh, in front of Sea Fresh. You know, a minor curb extension. We're being very careful on these curb extensions to not. Sometimes, you know, if as you come into town, traffic might back up for various reasons with, with traffic and so on, and to leave that right-hand turn lane there. So you might see a curb extension or a tighter radius just to help pedestrian safety, but we might not block off that lane as you come into town. On this side, we might not care as much, and as you leave town, it's not an issue. Is that a, a crosswalk? Uh, that is a proposed crosswalk. Because pro there isn't one there now. Right. Greg, uh, is there anything that's going to, or any discussion about increasing safety or visibility for the crosswalks that are going east to west on Ohio Avenue, so not actually crossing over Ohio Avenue, but the side streets? I actually, you know, I feel like I've been, had many close calls on Maricopa Highway, but my only close calls on Ohio Avenue is actually at night when I'm walking, say, from, you know, across Montgomery on the south side of Ojai Avenue right. for people who are turning because they are, you know, they're going faster than they probably should and they outrun their lights a bit. And so when they're turning into the lane is right when they see me and so they, you know, hit their brakes. And so... Uh, yeah, and yes, the answer is yes. And great. if you could go back a few more... Oh, wait, let's see. Maybe that was it, that... Uh, one more. The, the photograph, the aerial photograph. One more. I guess it was quick. Okay, if you can keep going back till we hit an aerial photograph right there, for instance. Okay, so now you're talking about Montgomery. So this curve extension, you can see it does exactly that. It's got a big radius, so your distance to walk is from there all the way to the big radius. So by pushing out with a curve extension and a tighter radius, that we're careful design to allow trucks to get around it. That tightens up that crossing and makes a vehicle, instead of cutting it quickly, has got to slow down and go around that corner carefully. That's where curb extensions can be really helpful. I mean, the same thing on, I don't, maybe you were talking North Montgomery here, see the same idea, that's room for it, curb extension. In this case, we're careful not to put it because a lot of times traffic backs up to make a mm -hmm. left-hand turn, so you want to yeah. maintain that right-hand turn. So we're being very careful with these curb extension designs to not congest traffic. You know. If we can go back to where we were about eight, 10 slides, and I think that really, uh, Maybe that, that's a pretty good one if you go back to just to try to give you a feel a little bit. Back one more. Uh, just to give you a feel again, I mean, that's what town looks like right now, right around Sea Fresh. I think that's the uh, bike uh, skate park on the right. And so that's what it looks like now. You've got this big open area. So if there's no cars parked, cars tend to feel like there's a lot of room. I can see everything and they move. But when you squeeze it a little bit with some tree pockets and uh, bike lane, it slows down traffic in this downtown corridor to improve bike and pedestrian back safety. One more? Oh, yeah. So, does the, the bike lane go all the way through to Gridley, you said? Right. Is that right? All the way out. Mm -hmm. It develops but more room as you get out there, a little bit more, so it'll be easier. The left hand turn at Fulton, coming off of, of South Fulton and going downtown. You can hard, the cars park so close to the edge, you can't hardly see past them to make that left hand turn. And I'm wondering if you. Oh, so you're saying when you come out of Fulton here? Right. And you right can't there, see because of line of sight here? You can't see anything because they park so close to the edge of the, right. the road there. In front There's of the been a couple road. accidents we've looked into there, and we've almost blacked a uh, red curb it, but uh, the businesses appreciate it, and the accidents that have occurred have all been people at very high speeds accelerating out of town. I mean, the, I think the most recent one we had was a blazer that was T-boned by a speeding car that knocked over the blazer. I mean, that meant they were going around 50 right. miles an hour. You know, and this, so what people are parking along here, and they park like all the way to the stop sign too. Oh, I so see. If there's a way to put lines, because so if you're coming this way and people are trying to turn, if there's a big backup, oh. if you want to go right, you can't because cars are parked all the way to the stop sign. 
Okay. Okay, I hadn't heard that one before, so that's good. We'll check into that too. So I think that uh, basically is hopefully the uh, 10 minute overview. I'm sorry about that, Superintendent Cantwell. <laughs> but uh, the uh, 10 minute, <laughs> it wasn't my fault. <laughs> sorry, it's our we com fault. we yeah, combine it with great. a question Clearly, period. So we're tell engaged. us the, the point of, of them coming. Just well, so this was a request from Kevin, and so it was ultimately just uh, informative for you to uh, let you know about you know what would be a very significant project, but also to seek feedback from this board if you'd like to have us return in uh, September with an actual item to state our support uh, um, for the project. As Greg said, the, uh, I believe timing right now is that City Council is going to hear this either end of September or early October. Um, and so they have a number of public hearings between now and then, and so uh, I know that the city would appreciate, or Greg said they'd appreciate, uh, you know, if, if we were in support to make that known, and so uh, that's ultimately that the next step question. here. That was my question. Do they want us to, they want, okay. Thank you. All right. So, uh, it, Paul and Harry, we got, yeah, if there's any questions, but it sounds like we got it, huh? And. Uh, so, sorry, were you thinking, uh, did you want any uh, additional information at all for your next uh, meeting and so on? Or are you pretty nope. good? So, you would yeah. just hear, because there's no agenda for us to vote, you would just That's personalize. Right. Yeah, I'd love, I'd love to do that, or do we send that to you privately? Uh, we can have a discussion right now. So, again, it's not an actual formal action item for tonight. It'd be about giving me direction about whether or not we do desire to see this return in September for an action item, and if so, you know, what form that might take, if it's a formal resolution, if it's authorizing Kevin or myself to write a letter of support, perhaps a letter to the editor or, you know, something of that form. So, uh, or if it is something that we appreciate Greg's time and, uh, and you know, at this time decide that we, this isn't an area that we want to actually take a formal position on. I support us, so if they, if they believe hearing our support would be helpful, I, I, yeah, I do know. too. So I, yeah, let's I, bring I it back. I think a resolution to the city council, would, you know, I mean, a letter to the editor is nice, but I mean, if you're going to go in front of the council. As a primary stakeholder, if it's all right if I mention, uh, as a primary stakeholder, I think that your input would be essentially, you know, it'd be, it'd be really important. I mean, uh, some people might question whether the school supports it or not. To let, is that, uh, safe route schools are a huge part of it. Yeah, I got to say, especially in this era of cell phones, it is so hard to trust your mm -hmm. kids to riding bikes and anything we can do to increase the safety. And also, I just think, I think the era of big car is ending, and Ojai should be at the cutting edge. I mean, I think this stuff is great. I think if it causes people to drive less, bike more, awesome. I know there's been some issues with some of the test bump outs where where on some of the intersections where people weren't prepared, myself included, um, I kind of saw them at the last minute. Um, but I have two thoughts about that. One is that that's what they're supposed to do, right, is to slow you down and get in the way. That's the whole point. So when I have to go way around to make the turn instead of cutting it at a 45, it's annoying because I'm used to doing it at speed at 45. Mm -hmm. But that's the point. Um, but I think the, the rub is, is people getting used to it. Um, and, and that, to me, is execution, right? So just like we were talking about potentially providing guidance for the change-up lane to come into the high school parking lot until people get used to it, I think there probably are strategies that the city can employ to make sure people are aware of bump outs that they, that they didn't see until they develop a new pattern. Well, the bump out day. <laughs> and keep in mind that this is Caltrans right away, so they are going to they go overboard on this stuff. Yeah, they they uh, for the city. I think those curb extensions we had cones on them for three months trying to warn people. And uh, well, some of those did kind of come out a little further than you might anticipate. Right. Uh, so the advantage is Caltrans is uh, extremely uh, the review process two years to permit this if we move yeah, right. fast. Yeah. So, right. <laughs> So the feedback I'm hearing is I will bring back a, a, an item that can be wordsmith and ultimately voted on at our September September 4th meeting. I do kind of like the idea of the test for the traffic. I think, you know, it's like sort of a due diligence thing because there may be parents who have that concern. Um, but uh, I think overall, I, I, I do, I do, I'm very attracted to this. I like the, the lights and all that stuff for the kids. We'll definitely pursue that uh, demonstration about uh, trying to catch it for football season. Well, and I, and I think to be clear, I mean, this is 
just the beginning of this process. I mean, this is just the earliest yes that then leads to all sorts of additional vetting, Caltrans, et cetera. And, you know, I think we can assume that stakeholders will be considered for different tweaks. Yeah, it's not going to happen overnight, that's for sure. We just found out that our, you know, surplusing of this property and the consideration of other things is not going to, it's going to be two years before we ever even get to look at anything. So we know what, you, we feel your pain. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Greg. All right. Thank you. Thank, thank you. thank you. Thank you. Hey, good to see you, Paul. Yeah, good to see you. Poor Carol and Javier. <laughs> <laughs> I hope this for our single plan presentation. Getting extra credit. Could cap our LCAP, it would be bigger than usual. So moving on to um, thanks again, Greg. Matil uh, the transition timeline uh, yeah. for Matilha. So we're bringing you a timeline of planned actions for the upcoming year in order to prepare for our first sixth grade group at Matilla And I've been actively working with Carol and Javier and they're here to help answer questions or participate in the conversation. Um, as well as working with Carol and Javier, I've been working closely with the elementary principals. Um, we all find this to be very exciting and our intention this year is to really create a sense of excitement among our fifth and sixth grade students um, to have them really feel like this is something special and unique that they're participating in. So um, we're looking forward to that. Uh, the timeline that we're presenting to you today is a work in progress. Uh, we'll be adding, adding and editing things as we collaborate and get input, input from stakeholders um, about the types of actions and planning that we need to incorporate into the process, so including any input that you guys have for us. Um, starting back in June, we began by asking the principals to set up a meeting with fifth and sixth grade parents. Um, uh, it was really interesting, Matilla, I'm not sorry, Matilla, um, Miramani did one on their Facebook page live, if you've ever seen anything like that. So they actually posted it live and you can actually go look at it. Um, it was a very good, rich discussion. Um, San Antonio held one with very little turnout, so they're going to be doing another one in September. Um, Topa held a teachers meeting first just to get some ideas on the table to help direct the parent conversation so they're going to actually be postponing their parent conversation until September but they do have a, a date uh, for that meeting and then as well uh, um, Miners Oaks will be having one in September so the two of those have been postponed a little bit. Um, Javier and Carol attended a very exciting conference down in San Diego for a few days all about middle schools. Um, all so, about middle schools. <laughs> <laughs> so they learned a lot. Um, and then of course in June we made reservations for our fifth graders because we wanted to ensure that our fifth grade students along with our sixth graders are all going to be going to see me this, this school year. Oh cool. So that happened. The, the hardest question of all. That was the one <laughs> that everybody was very worried about so everybody has a reservation. At the same time? or did No. You no, I think San Antonio is the only one, and they actually, um, I had made all the reservations at a different time than the sixth grade group, because we also want to be very sensitive to the sixth graders and making sure that they still feel like their trips and things are special. And that they go first. Um, right. Well, yeah, so we have a little bit of a conundrum at, at Topa, um, <laughs> where the fifth grade group is scheduled to go first, but we can talk about changing that. So um, just because we have the reservation doesn't mean we can't swap groups. But um, San Antonio has decided, though, that they are going to send their groups at the same time, and that just made more sense for their campus, which is why those discussions need to happen at each site because each site is unique and some sites might feel more comfortable going together or going separately. So, um, but they're all going, so that's good. Is there an issue with um, with funding? I know some kids end up requiring help from PTA and stuff and if there's two classes, I'm wondering if that will be an issue. I don't know if that'll be an issue. I mean, I do think that there are ways that we can um, all the school sites have carryover donation funds in their accounts, so there's a possibility that we could um, allow payments to be made by parents past the trip, and but front the money. So, and I know that the PTAs are um, very willing to participate in fundraising. So we absolutely intend on using every avenue and measure to make sure that every kid goes, as we always do. So. Um, we typically have a very high participation rate and a lot of scholarships. I mean, mm -hmm. a lot of kids do need those scholarships, so we do try to make sure that that happens for every kid. We, we do make it happen for every kid, so. Any other questions?
questions on CME. We're feeling good about that. There's <laughs> reservations made. Um, the big project that I would say that Carol and Javier and I have been working on, and a lot of it came from their middle school conference, is really looking at um, social and emotional learning curriculum, which is the key piece that will go into that advisory period. So we talked in detail about how that advisory period is not meant to be a study hall. It's not meant to just be a homeroom. It's actually meant to focus on social and emotional issues and to really use it as a learning opportunity for students. So we're going to be um, continuing to look at programs and then uh, choosing a couple to pilot throughout this year and getting you know teacher input before we choose one for the, for the transition. And so that won't be happening this year? That would wait until? Well, actually, the pilot will be this year. So oh, will. students will be accessing it. We're just not sure if, a, if that's Typically, with a pilot, small groups access it, and that's how we get sort of There's feedback. There's a lot more options that we're looking at right now, and we just want to pick what's the best one for our kids. What will you do that, like, into school? the tutorial slot or something? Like well, we'll that one we're having a conversation this morning about how do we do that. We did. I think it is. Uh, about which time of the day we can implement the tutorial is we had a conversation about maybe tutorial. Mm -hmm. There's other ways to do it. I mean, you know, we can ask the sort of size teacher to spend we have some teachers minutes. that are actually interested yeah. in piloting. We have options when it comes down to that. So if they're interested and they want to do it and be on a committee to help us decide. Um, but the actual should. advisory period would begin with the sixth graders coming in. Correct? Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Because that's going to change our bell schedule and a few other things that we will not have done. Right. This year. And then will that advisory period be just for sixth graders, but no. for seventh no, graders? Yes, for everybody. For everybody. Okay. Okay. Some of the programs have a specific um, program for just sixth grade and then another one for seventh and another one for eighth so that they don't get the same thing every year and then mm. by the time they're done they have the whole mm -hmm. thing. And then some of them are all the same. You would do the same thing with six, seven, and eight and then they change their curriculum for the next year. So there's all these variables in mm. every program. They're all a little different. Some have videos, some are all reading, some are, there's just a, a, a huge array of these that we're exploring and talking. I talked again today to another company to get um, a pilot and of course they all want money. So that'll be something we're all talking about too is funding to do the pilot. Um, Step one is to find the right one, the one yeah. that we feel would benefit our kids the most, and then we'll try it and see. If I it mean, works. it'll take us probably all year to figure just that one piece out because mm -hmm. we want it to be. Want to get it right. We want to get it right. Mm -hmm. So, and we did get a lot of suggestions of the advisory period at this conference that we were at that were very, very uh, meaningful to us as far as when to place it during the day and how to get your teacher buy in. <laughs> Are you having any issues with buying? We're about to find out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God we're having the meeting now. <laughs> you know, I think, I think, the, I think most part, for the most part they're on board. They're, they're excited board. about the idea. They yeah. know the benefits. Uh, and like I said, for the most part, I think we're going to be good. Really. At one of the faculty meetings I was at at the end of the year, I uh, I felt like a lot of people were excited. I felt some nervousness about what does it actually mean to teach social and emotional learning curriculum, and was it going to be topics that are uncomfortable? And what you find in this curriculum is that it's it, they're really not topics that are uncomfortable. They're topics like perseverance or courage. Um, courage. And so I have a feeling once we actually have something to show teachers what this actually looks like, I think that they're going to um, uh, embrace it more and, and feel like they're capable of running this kind of a program right so they're so used to teaching subject mm -hmm. and knowing their subject that when you say this to them they get a little intimidated that it's too warm fuzzy for them yeah but and it's very really, much an unknown right for them so as soon as we can get them to that point i think their concerns will be laid to rest well, once they get their incense and their crystals, they'll be totally cool. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, and plus you have those sixth grade teachers who have already been doing, I mean, at the elementary level, you're much, much more there. doing that. Mm -hmm. And so bringing them onto campus and the ones right. I've heard who are interested in it, you, know, you can't be w with those people and not get excited mm -hmm. about it. Absolutely. Right. So
so part of the review of these various options, it's, it's, it's involving faculty, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Like a like a yeah. like the same thing we're doing with the pilots for curriculum. Okay. Yeah. Um, so in addition to those things, starting in September, we will officially be doing our recruitment. We'll be um, determining how many teachers we actually do need at Matillaha, and then flying the positions, um, doing interviews um, potentially between September and October, and then we really do want to have our selection by October so that we can. Um, incorporate the sixth grade teachers into a lot of planning throughout the year and you see see here that I have you know kind of monthly meetings that we hope to be able to have um, um, Sharon, Sharon, the, the, the um, parental focus group oh I'm sorry I missed that um, is that like a one-time thing or an ongoing thing well just like what we were talking about doing at the elementary schools through conversation Javier decided he wants to do the same thing at Matillaha so actually asking fifth oh. and sixth grade parents to meet with them and the parents that'll be the eighth grade parents to have a focus group there to talk about you know the things that they'd like to see happen at Matilha. We have issues about what we need to see happen at the elementary schools this year, but those parents are um, equally should equally participate in what's going to happen at at Matilha when they transition. So Javier is going to also have a stakeholder group that he chats with and invites to the campus. Thank you for catching that. I missed that. This looks so good. You almost want to do it every year. <laughs> a timeline. Not just the transition <laughs> year, but every year. Oh, no. <laughs> it is good practice. Good best practice, I should say. Um, so additionally, we know um, Javier wants to uh, do some things a, a little bit in line with what we saw happening at Nordoff with the seniors having buddies. So next spring we're going to be talking about how to have eighth grade buddies with the incoming, um, I'm not sure how we'll do it since we have two groups coming in at the same time, maybe they'll all get buddies. So we'll have to kind of plan out that stuff. And again, we'll do that with current staff as well as since we'll know who the sixth grade teachers will be, they'll all be incorporated into those um, discussions. It's tricky because I actually, in one of my tutorials with the kids, I asked them about Matilha doing a buddies and they were like, yeah, but we're too close in age. Like mm -hmm. the seniors are so different from freshmen, but to be an eighth grader with a seventh grader, they felt was, or a sixth grader was. Right. So it'll be, yeah. you'll have to get the right kids. Right. Mm -hmm. I know some kids interested in leadership, just, you know, put in the plug. Okay. It, was so always, when, it was always funny along those lines, the, uh, at Topo they would do like a speech, you know, for the sixth grade, and it was often like a seventh grader. <laughs> When you leave, you will find the world will embrace you. It's like, was that, what, weren't you just here like four months ago? It's a tough world. It's very true. Um, so, and then what else on here? Next spring, of course, we will have to really do the hard work of creating a new schedule, which is um, not an easy task, right? Looking at how we're going to add the advisory period in. Um, and then one kind of tricky thing is, as I'm going to be talking to you about the pilots we're doing, the current sixth grade teachers in elementary aren't necessarily the sixth grade teachers that are going to be at the middle school, and so it didn't make sense to ask them to pilot the middle school mm. piloting materials. So when it comes to social studies, after we run both pilots, we're going to have to have some sort of meeting with the sixth grade teachers that are actually the ones that are going to be at Matillaha and have them actually choose from all four or have a discussion about how to choose from all four because we're going to have to decide if um, ideally they would pick curriculum that's the seventh and eighth graders are going to do. Um, but we might have one of those sort of transition years where they're just more comfortable choosing what the K through six had piloted. So that'll just have to be a discussion and it will involve all the teachers in the you know decision and of course we'll bring it to you guys for the adoption. So. The, um thing that you attended in San Diego, did it talk about schedule stuff at all? Yeah, I mean, sure, I, but, yeah, that's why I, I mean, I know it's a long there. way off, but for me, my head, I'm like, how are you going to do that? Are you going to have, you know, because you've got longer periods possibly for the sixth graders, but you've got, um, I, I've, from what I thought I heard, you're going to, they're going to have uh, electives together. So it'll just be interesting when you start, when you finalize it, I'd be very interested. The class periods are going to be on the same schedule. What is at the recess? Recess is going to be the same. Right. And then, walks. and even when we call things first and second period, they're going to be the same time, but a group of kids might stay in the same class for two periods. So we're going to try to keep the schedule the same, but the some of the stuff you guys discussed at the meeting was, do you have advisory before school, but then some kids then choose to miss it and it's so important. Do you have it right before lunch? 
So those kind of things it need to be, be discussed. It will be in the morning, and it will not be probably probably first. Will be first. But not necessarily first there period or zero period. So many principles there that, said, no, don't do it first that they've already tried all that. And yeah. It didn't work. Uh -huh. And they were saying because kids just come up, late. No, it's only it's only advisory. You're not oh, you don't. It's that. okay. You yeah. can be 20 yeah. minutes late. Not a real yeah. Advisory, yeah. Advisory, which yeah. really, some of the principals were saying and the administrators were saying, is the most important part of the day. Yeah. So we were thinking after snack. I think. Mm -hmm. Another couple of options. Yeah. I mean, we have to get input from our staff too. Absolutely. And you're not considering at all the separated lunches or snacks, or is that still being talked about? We hadn't wanted to because we want there to be an easy flow if we want the sixth graders to go into the elective periods. Um, I think that we could still have discussions on it, though. I mean, how to do that is hard. How to have a separate lunch, but then still have opportunities for I the rest of the periods to be. The kids. At the conference. We're, we're, we're currently working on getting an activities director for our staff. Who's going to be working on those activities to incorporate six, seven, eight graders during recess? So, what a great opportunity for them to to be incorporated in the school culture and become part of the right. part, part. I of just the I know for the parents that was the big fear that they'd rather sixth graders not be mingling. Mingling. There's two things I'd like to say. When we were at the conference, many of the administrators and the principals would shared with us that it was best to have them together because if they're so segregated all day. Why are we doing this, number one? And on our campus, where we're going to have the sixth graders, there's a whole row of tables out there where they will have a place that they'll have lunch mm -hmm. at the same time, but if they want to be in their, in their, area. In their little area, they'll have a, a place. Give it a shot and try it out. Yeah. <laughs> Any really questions? It was, it was wonderful to hear how other people have done it and then gone back or modified and we're getting the benefit of their trial and error. Mm -hmm. Not that it will always fit our situation, but certainly just the suggestion to not have advisory period, first period, um, was valuable to us. So, and then uh, to end the year in the spring, just like we always bring the sixth graders over to do a visit, we will certainly be having a, the fifth graders also come over to do a visit. Um, and then we, again, we welcome input. So if there's things we need to add to the timeline or things that... And that would happen on the same day, right? Fifth and sixth on the same no, day? No, it's separate days. Two days. So Two then days. the eighth sixth graders, graders or the seventh and eighth would miss more school? Or goes to the support to it, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a noon dismissal or 11. Yeah. yeah. We, we it's not just for this year, obviously. Right. Yeah, right. Following years, we should go back. Right. Yeah. And transportation, too. Oh, right. Uh, I mean, I we just bought new buses up here. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing that kind of, you know, had come up is, you know, when we were talking about it were the occasional parent who was just concerned about safety and everyone, I think, was on clearly the same page that that was a paramount issue. Mm -hmm. I still think maybe it makes sense, or at least we, it should be discussed, whether at least in the very beginning stages, in the first couple months or for a few weeks at least, especially if they're all going to be intermingling, to just have more people out there. Yeah. Yeah. Whether it's, and whether it's, it's you know, employees or even employees plus PTA, whatever, just, mm -hmm. just to overdo it. Absolutely. Because we effectively made, I think we... Yeah. Kind of are are on the record as saying that we would be very uh, vigilant about yeah, safety. And yeah. I think what you just talked about activities. I mean, I think my for my boys, that was the big shock about Matilla. Has there's nothing to do. Like they wanted to, you know. I know that they they weren't still using the swings at elementary school, mm -hmm. but there there's handball and there's they just didn't That's feel cool. like. I mean, Matilla was. Dodgeball, that was about it, you know, because the nets are bad, or there's not enough basketballs, or there's, there's, no, there's no handball courts, you know, it's... it's. So we're definitely rethinking the idea of activities when we recess. Yeah. Yeah, we're definitely that's why we're, at it. That's why we want to do an activities director this year, so that we can create some sort of program, so that the following year, 
Got or have, have the parents do a gaga ball pit or something, you know? Well, it doesn't all have to be, like, physical activity. When you think about, you know, activities, even just if you think about Nordoff doing, like, the class competitions where you have teachers out there and you're rooting, you know, two groups on because they're stacking cups or whatever they were doing at Nordoff. I mean, those are the kind of things that help people feel like they're all together doing something. Because mm -hmm. not everybody's going to go, you know, play dodgeball or go play basketball. So it's, it's a matter of offering activities and things that engage all of them and, you know, make them feel the sense of togetherness as opposed to just sixth graders over here and seventh graders over here and eighth graders over there. So that's fun. But I, but I think it's true. You know, there is, it's funny, as you mentioned, Janet, just think about there obviously must, you guys see it, but that transition, because I, I remember when I was in, I was a junior high school person, but you got my vote anyway. Um, <laughs> but I was a junior high school, and in junior high school, we never did it. You know, it's just everyone just stood around, like, you know, it was cool. And, but when I was in elementary school, you get on, you know, you, you just run to the playground. You'd be playing kickball, you'd be, you know, so there is that transition. And now that we've got fifth graders over there, I mean, uh, sorry, sixth graders over there, um, we're going to, they're, they're more in that, you know, they're going to have more of that expectation of running out and playing something. And maybe it, it'll change just because they're in a different environment, but it's interesting. I it changes around it. Christmas anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they're all they just standing interested. around. <laughs> they become interested in other things. <laughs> <laughs> by fifth grade, by fifth grade, sitting around on the playground in elementary school. Yeah. Yeah. But I, th I think of the cartoon Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, and you remember they, the reindeer were still competing before they started going to the dances, so. <laughs> I think you're right, though. It's around Christmas. <laughs> mm -hmm. Can I um, ask a question? Is that okay? Of course. Uh, um, my question is that elementary teachers and the feel of an elementary school for the teachers is very different than the junior high. And I'm wondering, what are there? Are you guys doing anything to help the elementary sixth grade teachers who are moving over there sort of integrate into the school with the junior high teachers? Because well, I noticed have, there's a big difference between the two group, two groups. So we we have on the timeline monthly, monthly collaboration meetings with them. And so they'll be meeting with your current staff. Right. Oh, that's yes. what you mean. Okay, right. good. So they're integrated. Right. Okay, that's good. I just felt like it would be very weird to show up and go, hi, we're new. No, no, yeah. And we're, we're taking over this whole section of the school, and, and our Javier kids are and I, here. And, you know. Javier and I will do everything that we can do to make them feel just as welcome yeah. as we would. Yeah, as of, of course. It's just they're, they have a whole different uh, temperament. They're going to love us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Angie, to answer your question, starting in November, we want to do monthly meetings where those sixth grade okay. teachers are over there meeting with the staff, so that by the time they start, they've had they're several opportunities. Staff. Yeah. Okay. Good. And that's why I think it's going to be so great to select those teachers early, mm -hmm. so that they are becoming part of us. I, I think so. Too. Christmas party, they'll be invited, and the year party, they're going to be invited too. Okay. You might have it at their house. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I know those houses. Yes, you will. <laughs> <laughs> so any other input from you guys as far as the timeline or anything you'd like us to be thinking about? We'll continue to bring it to you as we adjust it. This is clearly a lot of work. A lot of work. Um, so, um, I, you know, in the course of this conversation, we did talk about sort of the reinvention of the, the whole approach. And and I and I know that that's in here somewhere, mm -hmm. uh, but not real explicit. Um, and so I just hope that we don't lose that. I want to integrate the sixth graders and their instructors really well, but I don't want us to lose sight of that aspirational thing of really remodeling the the, the school in a different approach. Because I know that he's talking about some fluid boundaries between classes and some other things. A lot of those are really exciting, so I hope that that will continue as well as the you know the integration. Well, the the different components that we discuss that make a middle school you know a middle school those will be things that we incorporate into our planning meetings as we're meeting each month and talking about how to do that as best we can. Yeah, I think this is great. And I think that's right. That's important for us to hear that too because I think our support was really for a middle school model, mm -hmm. not a junior high model where you add the sixth graders. Right. Mm -hmm. And you guys will 
you'll need to know what to say when you see people that's right. in public that what it is. But that's our mission. Yeah. No, that's exciting. I think it's going to be really interesting. Yeah, I, I, I distinctly remember even, I think, Javier, you said at some point we were, we were talking about some aspects of what you had learned in the course of the looking at middle school were things that you thought you could do anyway, even if we didn't support the transition. Exactly. So I think, exactly. I think that's yes. kind of where Mike's coming from. It's like that part of it, you know, is obviously going to be part of it. Um, not not just the fact that we're becoming a middle school and we have middle school textbooks, but also what are what those other things were. But meeting the needs of those yeah. students in that age group. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. In this day and time. Thanks. So deciding on the name, the Matillaha, the word Matillaha is not a word. We're deciding it's a Ramirez millennial. <laughs> 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 I think we're we're all <laughs> thinking Matillaha Middle School, but we should have a staff discussion and it incorporates thinking about, you know, lots of things. So yes. And Javier might have some creative suggestions sure. we'll have to go uh, Yeah, we've already heard his. <laughs> <laughs> It's okay. important for everyone to learn how to spell Matillaha. <laughs> so I think three years there will be a good foundation. It for looks it. wrong yeah. no matter how many times you write it right. Someday that will be on the SAT and our guys will kick butt. Oh, that's right. <laughs> you know, a lot of people s pronounce it wrong. Matillaha? Um, Matillaha is what I hear. Oh, At Disneyland like for the music. Northern California yeah. pronounces it Matillaha and I had to tell them. You mean Matillaha and Ojai? <laughs> that's it, that's us. Yeah. At Disneyland, the award was for Matalija. Anyone else? So, right. moving on to 7.3.2. Yeah, thank you, uh, yeah, thank you very much. 7.3.2 is Elementary and Middle School Social Studies textbook. Yeah, so we're just bringing to you this as an informational item, letting you know that we're getting underway with our social studies pilot. Uh, last year, social studies curriculum went through the state board approval process, and so um, in the spring, we took a team of teachers to VCOE, and we get to hear from all the publishers and see and hear, you see the curriculum and then hear from the publishers about it. From that point, we then made a second uh, trip down to VCOE for the entire day where we sit in their library, and the VCOE library has all the curriculum out, and we really scrutinize it using a rubric. And then, um, unfortunately, Nordoff teachers were not able to make that, so we were still to do that with Nordoff, but uh, our elementary teachers and our junior high teachers did choose two um, choices, two programs to pilot this year. So we are piloting studies weekly, and uh, Teachers Curriculum Institute, or it's just referred to as TCI in elementary school, and then uh, Nat Geo, so Natural Geographic California Middle School Social Studies, and Discovery um, in the middle school. Interestingly, we're seeing more and more of this, but certainly in social studies, all of these um, come with really rich online platforms, and in many cases, you have the option of just buying the online platform. So we have some of the materials here, and we will definitely have them out in the, um, the district office for people to peruse throughout the year as we pilot them, but you really can go online and see a whole lot and kind of demo things online. So if any, anybody wants to do that, this is sort of a, uh, an invitation for people to peruse the materials. Um, certainly want to involve our parents and our community as well. Our teachers are the ones most actively involved, of course, in um, the, the pilot and, and deciding, and of course, in the spring, we'll bring to you our proposed curriculum for adoption. And looking into the, I mean, the online programs, it's yearly, so every year you spend $78. Yeah. And How does that compare to how often you flip a book? If you adopt a book, you're typically staying with it for seven years, like the adoption. I mean, you just have to buy new ones when you um, have somebody not return it or it's too damaged. So but we would definitely be taking that into consideration. I think with social studies curriculum, it's ex the online components are also extremely important just because we know that after seven years, things change so much. So when you're buying the online um, curriculum, you're getting the newest updates, which is also, um, you know, something to be considered, especially so with social studies, which is different than math or um, at the middle charts. school. Though I know it's, I 
think. I mean, our kids would, you know, you'd have your book at home and you would have to read that. So that you've got, we've got students who don't have online access at home, so the homework might be. We would definitely have to provide them with something to be at home with. A lot of these come with both, so a textbook and the online um, curriculum. And that was part of the discussion that I had, especially with the middle school teachers. Um, they would really be rethinking their homework model and whether or not that they, they would even be asking students to go home and do homework um, if it were an online platform. So they are definitely actively having those conversations as they think about the, the curriculum that we may choose. When was the last time we adopted curriculum for social studies? A long time. I don't know. I know we prolonged it and we're at a place right now, for example, this is actually kind of a unique pilot, both of these. Um, we're actually, every student and every teacher is going to be using them. At the middle school, it was possible because there's so few teachers, there's actually only three teachers, so they all want to pilot it, so every kid's going to have access to the pilot. But for the um, elementary school, the reason we're doing it is because we actually can't even purchase the social studies workbooks that went with the curriculum that we most actively used with our elementary school, the curriculum is so outdated they don't even make those workbooks anymore. So we've been having to use supplemental materials anyway. So we've actually purchased studies weekly um, as sort of a bridge piece this year. We've been doing that in the past year's um, Scholastic News and Time Magazine. We've been purchasing things like that as supplemental materials to get us through because we it's been several years now that we have not been able to order our consumables that went with our adoption because of how long ago it was. Um, so I didn't answer your question exactly, but it's been a long time. Okay. Could you just quickly, what, what is the elementary school social studies program? What, I mean, what, what grades are doing social studies? Every grade. Okay, so when you pilot this, obviously you don't have every single elementary school teacher attend, right? When how, we, how, did, how did we decide who were the deciders? When we went out to pick the programs, that was just, I sent out an email to every elementary teacher saying, would you like to be a part of the pilot process? I, we had like, I think six that were part of it, and then the three uh, middle school. So they were the ones that choose it, but actually everybody will have input in which one we choose to adopt, because actually everyone will be using both programs this year. Studies Weekly will be our main program, but everybody will be using TCI for a portion of the year as we do the six to eight week kind of look at TCI. So that's kind of a neat thing. That's rare to actually have every teacher be able to give input as to which one they believe we should officially adopt. I don't remember social studies in K through two. Yeah, I'm just trying to think. In the third grade, you started to don't math. think of anything in second or first grade either. There were workbooks. That's what I saw my first year here. There were these workbooks that kids worked out of. I don't know if you remember what you used in K. I know second grade for sure. Mm -hmm. Social um, studies in kindergarten is more social, social skills and working. With yes. But, you know, right. learning about working with each other, learning about the school, um, you know, it's really community. It's social, community. It's just those, that social skills. Um, first grade, it's more, again, it's, it's learning about your community, you know, when we talked about. You learn about, like, the library, and you learn about, well, like, you know, the, like holidays. I'm trying to think that's of, like, true. used to oh, watch family videos with yeah, yeah, families and uh, the rules, the community, um, fire department, yeah, 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 yeah. Just, post just, office, that's right, yeah, you go yeah, to all, those that, that, yeah. all those kinds of things. Just never thought of it as social, social studies, exactly. Social studies. Even though we don't think of it because we're so attuned to it now. So, what, what so obviously, like, you're not going to be accessing materials to do that, presumably. Those, those K and one. Those There's, are things that you would do. Well, we would use the weekly. Okay. We would use the weekly studies. Okay. There's materials and there's okay. things for them to read and even on these online platforms, there's things for kindergartners to do and first graders to do. Okay. And then, but certainly embedded in that would be potentially activities that the teacher would do with the students because a lot of, especially what's happening at those younger ages, is a lot of conversation and a lot of um, practice of. And, and especially like kindergarten, first grade, trips. a lot of it is like we. Used to, I would watch video. They were great little babies, they had little songs, and then we would talk about it and we'd do an activity, and that would be one whole week. And so you might not even have seen it come home because it's something that you're just doing, and the activity might, might be just something in the class, it's right. not a piece of paper that went home. So. Cool. But like you'll see studies weekly back there, there's 
that comes with like a newspaper looking thing that's every week. That's how they're is set up instead of a textbook. And there's definitely one for K and first grade, so you can see that. And then when it comes to the online stuff, even though there's stuff for students to individually do, a lot of it is like the teacher might show the videos or the whatever's on that online platform because of course there might be difficulties for kindergartners to do a lot of it independently online. So even though it's online, the teacher can access it and show it the whole group and then that would present opportunities for discussion and activities from those videos. And again, you can see all that online if you want to go look at these um, different programs. You can get like 30 day trials and see what it has to offer. Any other questions about social studies? No. Okay, so um, with language arts, I was approached. This is not um, the cycle for. So language let me arts. just make clear that we yeah. are, I think, going to the next uh, item, which 7. is seven point three point three. Yes. Middle school English language ELA textbook pilot. Yes. So I was approached by the English teachers at Matoha this year. Um, they were under the impression they were accurate that we only bought the program for two years springboard and they were under the impression that that was a pilot two years um, when I look back at the records we actually did you guys actually did adopt it um, however because it's only been purchased for two years we actually there's no reason we can't stop if they would like to take the time to look more thoroughly at other programs we can do that so they've opted to do that so we have purchased springboard for another year because we do need to have curriculum for our students but the English teachers would like to look, um, they went down to the BCO library with me for a day, separate from the social studies trip, and we looked at all the different state board approved adopted programs, and they did like mirrors and windows and study sync. And so what they would like to do is do two six to eight week pilots this year with those two programs, and then uh, bring to us something in the spring, whether they decide to just stay with Springboard, or propose to you a new adoption for the remainder of the next so three we, years of the we purchased course. springboard we didn't purchase textbooks then. no okay. it was they were consumables okay. so you have to purchase them and we purchased them for two years so now we've purchased them for another year so there's no we didn't lose out in any cost by we won't lose out in any cost by choosing to adopt something different for okay. the future that was my concern I was like what no we didn't More we're not going to waste any money okay. Do the pilots cost money? Do we pay for a pilot? They can sometimes. So one of the things I'm experiencing with one of the um, social studies pieces is that they'll give us 60-day trial with the online materials, but they don't want to provide the consumable book that goes with it unless we pay for them as part of the pilot. So pilots can sometimes cost money, even for the SEL curriculum that um, Carol was talking about. She's trying to work with the um, reps right now and some of the, some of them will do a 60 day free trial and others are saying you need to purchase it for a usually it's a reduced fee and it's a small it's still a smaller chunk of time um, but so that does that does happen where sometimes you have to pay for a part of the pilot um, we're trying not to do that and if we can stick to the online content and feel comfortable that we're getting enough um, enough information about how much we like the program most of the online stuff in addition to have, having interactive stuff they also have the exact pages that are in the, okay. the workbook. So you actually do get to see everything that you would have physically. Um, so presuming that we feel that it's actually accessible to our students and to our teachers, we would likely try just to do it online as we do the pilot instead of paying for books. And so when you pilot and you say it's a 60-day trial, so students do the, the regular curriculum and then for 60 days the they switch? Yeah, so the teachers will have to decide the units that they normally teach and then, you know, stop it. teaching whatever unit they just finished and then pick that unit from, especially with social studies where you want to cover certain things, they'll pick that unit when they then pick up the pilot. And then they might go back to their regular curriculum and then finish a unit and then choose the exact unit that matches up with what they need to teach next. There's a craft to it. I didn't realize all the intricacies. <laughs> yeah. Especially with math, right? Yeah. That's especially hard. So. Well, we're not doing math this year, so that's good. Okay, so any questions on the language arts pilot? So it'll be happening all this year, and this is, you know, again, just information to let you know it's happening, and when you see teachers, you can ask them how it's going and get their feedback, and feel free to look, because like I said, all these materials are online, so if you want to go looking and perusing yourselves, and we'll, again, we'll have the physical copies in the district office. Thanks, Cheryl. Yep. 
Mr. Grant, finally. Well, Mr. Ruff, I hope you're not disappointed. You didn't get the other Mr. Grant. <laughs> see, you're, see you're, you didn't know. You were the one we were hoping it was. I'll like this story. Well, good evening, everybody. Julie, are you getting the PowerPoint? Yes. This okay. is 7.4.1, and this is the update on the Mesa Day project. So the, the big item, and Julie, thank you also for being here. The big item for tonight's discussion is really talking about the Matilha kitchen and potential dining hall remodel. Um, but before we get there, you know, I have been sending, and since Greg's arrival in our uh, district, you uh, you guys have been receiving far greater updates, uh, you know, more frequently and more detailed than uh, we ever been able to do in the past with Metro J projects. You'll see in the materials, the first item is uh, just the most recent update on the current summer project. So before we move into the Matillaha kitchen discussion, we did want to give you an opportunity, uh, rather than Greg reporting anything tonight, we're going to have a formal report for summer projects at our next meeting where you'll see some pictures, although they're not too exciting. They're mainly roofs, uh, but you will see they look newer than the old. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but we wanted to give the opportunity in case anyone did have any questions or anything that they want further information on from, from Greg on current summer projects. I had a quick question about the Nordoff HVAC that has been pushed back. It says the thermostats yes. aren't working. Does that mean that at least they have AC during the day, but the thermostat isn't working? Or does that mean teachers are prepping without AC? The short answer is... We don't have to wait two years for Caltrans to approve this one. <laughs> That's good. We have an HVAC contractor who has not missed an opportunity to disappoint us collectively. The accomplishment was that, the promised accomplishment was that the work will be completed Friday to the 10th at Topa Topa and Matillaha. They came close, but they couldn't engage five air conditioning units at Topa Topa because they didn't have filters for the HVAC equipment. That's like going golfing without tees. <laughs> but you, you just don't operate that way. At Matillaha, they had all but one unit operational the administration office, the first room occupied before school starts. They didn't have a filter. At the high school, work is ongoing. The promise is Friday the 18th, all air conditioning units will be operational either by the existing dial uh, operator or the new thermostat. Crews are working to complete the contract is broken into two parts. Mechanical with the actual air conditioner and then the controls, the thermostat. In addition to the thermostat, there's sensors on the doors and sensors in the room, motion sensors. Those people will extend their activities into non-instructional hours beginning Monday the 20th. I can't tell you how long that's going to take because they can't tell me how many they're going to complete. I won't know till the first of the week. Is this climate tech? Yep. But we don't know, the answer to the question is, does the teacher have AC? And yes. it's just they don't have a remote or they don't have AC? They will have AC Friday the 18th. So all or the this 17th, next week, me. they won't have AC? This week? This, this is, week. This I guess week. we are in this. Yeah, yeah so we are in this week. Days. So, <laughs> all right. I was I asked the question last weekend when I read it, but okay. Well, call me. So, just call me. Well, I I forgot that we're halfway through the week. Is that okay. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, again, they, they haven't off. missed every opportunity they could to disappoint, and we did have a unit at Topa Topa Room Twenty One, where the unit had a failed circuit board. And that was brought up by a Climatech representative. Please understand, Climatech doesn't self-perform this work. They have subcontractors. And Climatech is not involved on a daily basis providing oversight of their subcontractors. And we, as a district, do not have a contractual link to the people performing the work. We, I have to, it's a game of mother may I, it sucks. 
you have to go to Climate Tech, and during my seven week and two day tenure, <coughs> God bless you, Kevin. Thank you. I've worn out the poor guy from Climate Tech because we have expectations, and they're not meeting them. And there's been not to degrade the field we're in, but there's been kindergarten level behavior between the climate tech folks and the roofing folks on various sites. And the architect, RNT, who provided drawings to facilitate the roofing projects, left us with a small bit of scope gap. They gave direction to remove an existing apparatus, but they didn't include direction to replace the existing apparatus. So then there becomes the spit and holler session, who's going to pay for it? Well, so far, we have not paid an extra for that specific condition. Because I don't appreciate being challenged when I represent people that approved a $2.9 million contract and you're coming to me for a dime item. That's inappropriate. And frankly, you got the wrong old man to piss off. Good. We're glad that you're uh, the old man who's pissed off. Oh, you better bet. <laughs> and uh, in, in a nutshell, and excuse me for my language, ladies, I come from a time and place where Stevedorian language was acceptable, and I apologize for that. Um, we have two camps, roofing projects, air conditioning projects. Both sets of projects suffered delays. The roofing projects, we this district captured a wonderful resource from Garland Industries. They've had a crew of three different individuals on site daily, and they have caught workmanship issues that have delayed these projects beyond the completion date, and it's all due to corrective work. And it's, it, it, for me, it's a relief. Right. And That's in the what? The roofing? The roofing. And one of the delays specific to um, Miramonte is due to the amount of materials required to do the second effort after the removal of the first effort. Garland Industries didn't have the materials in stock. So we find a condition where the delay is beyond the control of the contractor, we cannot assess liquidated damages, and it's all documented through Garland. And this will be brought, depending on how much level of detail you wish to receive in September, we have documentation for these efforts. The one project that I will be bringing forward to you for the approval of additional funds will be the roofing project at Miners Oaks, where there was an unforeseen condition <clears throat> that required additional carpentry to elevate the base that the air conditioning units are mounted on on one building. They were so close to the roof, it didn't allow for the roofing system to be installed. This roofing system has a approximately inch to inch and a half high density foam, and then there's another layer, and then you have the what we commonly refer to as rolled roofing, the composite, and then there's two separate coatings on top of that. This system delivers an additional R10 insulation value to the roof, so we had a conflict, we had a spatial conflict. The contract had $20,000 for a contingency to repair existing damaged wood. That contingency was consumed by $14,700 in replacement of, of existing roof deck. It left a residual of 5000 and change. I need to come back to request $9,501 to pay for this additional carpentry. That'll be before you in September. It, I was not here. Neither Garland Industries nor the architect identified this condition. I have to address it as an unforeseen condition. And with the contract value on this particular site of $415,000, it, it's a fraction of a percent. 
Any other questions on current summer projects? Again, we'll give a more thorough uh, review next meeting, but if not, we can move into just a general thing. Yeah. And I, I do want to say the quality of the detail is much, much better. Um, my, my big concern, and I've expressed this before, is I think I missed one meeting in the last few years, but I have never seen brought before the board a list of $30 million worth of projects with the budget to say, hey, what do you want to do? So that was October of 17 was when we did that. I, I can. I don't recall that. Okay, so I mean, we, we do have our uh, um, facility bond plan. It's all, uh, I can send a copy to you. I but mean, before we, the election, there was kind of a rough thing, but, but it seems like everything it's, well, you, do you want to do this or this, but it's all so piecemeal that I don't know that we're making a reasonable, a, a fair choice. We did, we did have it, so I think if we're going to be making changes, if we're talking about Matilla and making a choice, we should be able to have that. Like, so, sure. you know, if we make this choice, that means we're going to lose Yeah, what, what can't we do? Yeah. Right. And, so we'll, and we'll and talk about that here as well. I mean, we've done this time and time again with things where we're saying, okay, do you want to spend an extra million here? Well, of course, this is so much better than that. Which would you choose? I, I choose the good one, not the terrible one. But, uh, but as a result, we're deciding intrinsically not to do something else. But I don't think we know what we're deciding we're not going to do. Are we talking about, are you moving into the topic of the... Well, this is a good transition. Into yeah, yeah. Topic. So I assure you that that will be part of this presentation, is that we will say specifically what will have to come off of the current $35 million plan in right. order for us to increase the cost of the uh, Matilla Hop project, right. project. And if we could keep, apparently I forgot, but if we could keep that $35 million plan in front of us, I would appreciate it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, that's... Good idea. Before we move on to that, I, I'm just curious. You've expressed a lot of frustration with climate tech. <laughs> yes, sir. And so I'm just wondering, um, what are we doing about that? Mr. Shanahan, <laughs> it's a circumstance like having a relative stay too long. At this point in the project, our recourse is a bit limited because this is an energy consulting program not a co or a contract not a construction contract okay. so i do have we have limitations to our recourse but at this point all efforts are to be accommodating and supportive so that we can usher them out of dodge i've had enough would it be helpful uh, for us to ask, you know, they made a real, you know, I, I guess the expression is a dog and pony show, um, and uh, maybe the board should ask if they could come back and explain what's going on, because I certainly didn't understand that we were entering into, I understood that we were entering into a, uh, a soup to nuts contract whereby they were going to provide, you know, a black box of services that would, end, you know, leave us with this great result and if there's something deficient in what we did or we got hoodwinked in some way I think I'd like to talk to the people that run that company and let them know how frustrated we are my recommendation would be let's go the course because I've made inquiries about training for our staff and the staff doesn't just include Russ and David Rogers faculty, the site administrators need to understand how these new thermostats work. I would like to see their follow through toward the, their completion of their deliverables to the district before we take action. Rest assured you will have no trouble getting them back because there's a carrot out there for solar energy. Do understand the climate tech does a very good job of compartmentalizing their services. Sales, ivory tower. Project management, 
asking them contractual questions. <laughs> they don't know. Training after after installation. We have guys. That's a quote. We have guys. I've got on the internet. I'm not a vengeful person, but I like to be informed. Can't find any dirt on these people on the internet. I think they pay people to scrub their internet posts or complaints. They're owned by Bosch. They're huge. And uh, I don't know how they got where they are, but well, it I, is I, disappointing. I just, yeah, an, you know, an alternative approach would be to let them know now that we're concerned and hope that we then just become the squeaky wheel that they decide to, to over uh, serve because you know how many school districts call them back after that dog and pony show? Probably not that many. Well, Andy uh, has seen my correspondence to them, and I have got their attention to the point where if I call their assistant project manager, he doesn't respond. I call their project manager, he doesn't respond. They get their heads together and try to figure out what the heck I want because they know that they can't buffalo me. And it's not that I'm a genius. It's the simple fact that it, obvious things like, really, you made a commitment, we've reported out, we've reported up, and you didn't miss the mark because you didn't bring air filters. This is Keystone Cops nonsense. And Kevin, I have to say that to me that's a that's I mean that's what we have Greg for. I mean that's micromanaging. Well, I think he's already a, said that he doesn't think it's a good idea, yeah. so yeah. so I don't want to spend well, too much time on what's not the project tonight. Well, so I, I however, Jane, I think it's really important for us. I mean, this is the first report we've had in the course of spending that thirty five million dollars on a this is a two point nine million dollars. Yes, it is, Kevin. Uh, part of it. It's I, I as a fiduciary, I want to know what's going on, and, and I and I don't. You know, at some very soon point, I think the board may need to get engaged because we were the ones who approved this this contract. Yeah, if if we're not getting the the uh, the product that we paid for, but if it's frustrating for him and if the timeline is changing, I find that it's frustrating. But I don't know that that's. Well, you know, it's not it's not not happening, and we need to make another decision, and we need to find another contractor, and those are different. No, we're we're close enough to the end that we can see this through, and just like a home improvement, there may be a delay at the at the very final, but we're going to get there. But yes, we should drop the hammer on them. I'm behind it 100 <laughs> percent. Well, and I'll also just. You know, I, I want to be clear that they, you know, we don't want this to just be a headlong rush to the end where we get a, a crappy result. Understood. Because, because no, they know that you know they have to finish, and yeah. then you you know you drop that little reference to the training, and then we've got guys. Yeah. That's part of our contract, and that was one of the things they sold us was this this uh, the training. So, you know, you know this, but. Uh, well, I appreciate that you have good recollection of the sales promotion. Because service after sale so far, it's a disappointment in all sincerity. And uh, we'll revisit this September 5th, 4th, and provide you an update before then. Because, we, again, we have requested about the training. Um, we a I asked specific questions about the warranty and how that's handled. And... In all candor, I'm not too plussed because we go to Climatech, they go to Allied Mechanical, their subcontractor, or they go to somebody named C and D who installed the controls. So it's we don't have contractual relationship with those two subcontractors. We can't go direct. So um, I'm skeptical about what kind of warranty service we're going to receive. I asked questions about where we can expect to anticipate failures based on their historic data. So here's my concern. Yes, sir. There is an extraordinarily high level of dissatisfaction coming out of you tonight. Oh, no, there isn't. What could be, <laughs> including what could be viewed as some pretty insulting remarks about the vendor. Um, and if, if the dissatisfaction is that high, 
it's dismaying to hear that there's nothing that we can do about it. I will revisit the contract, but from what I found, traditional construction contract mechanisms are not, do not apply to this energy services agreement. Well then, I'm, I'm, it, it's hard for me to understand how we would be dissatisfied with someone for not producing what their contract doesn't require them to produce, right? So if there's no obligation for them to do some of the things that you're complaining about, then I'm not quite sure where the dissatisfaction comes from. If there's an obligation and there's an expectation, then I would understand that. So I'm a little confused, and I'm not oh, sure okay. what, what but I'm let supposed me, to do. you want to jump in okay. and get it out? Lawyer. And do you have I'm an opinion about a that? A little confused as to what I'm supposed to take away from okay. this message. The, the most simple, the most basic takeaway I ask you to accept. I asked for a completion schedule in August so that I could report up and out. I received a schedule that showed Topa Topa completed June 27th, and my inquiry was August the 6th or so. You sent, I called the project manager who's based in Orange County. You send me a schedule, an updated schedule that identifies work completed in June, and we're not there? And the response was, well, we don't go by that. This isn't my first construction project, Mr. Huttenberger. Schedules are developed with an element that's referred to as float. Float is time in a schedule to allow for unforeseen conditions. A schedule will identify a task to have an early start and a late start. It will identify a task to have an early finish and a late finish. With all of that, so my, you are? Or it comes back to what's the point? The point is, they're not doing what they say they're going to do. And then when they're asked questions, they don't give direct responses. So what do you want from us? Because you just told Kevin that, that our intervention would be premature. Well, I'm welcoming his offer to speak up for the district. If I um, present you with um, I don't know how better to present you the issues I've identified. I, yeah, I, I think what I, I, you know, obviously we're having a little moment here as a board. Uh, Sorry, I guess guys. It's okay, but I think I think to sort of bring some some clarity. Okay. When when we have our meeting in September, uh -huh. you know, I think you should consult with Andy. Okay. I'm president, so I can also be involved, but we should discuss whether we want to bring before the board more of this discussion about what's going on with climate tech or whether we feel like it's a bad situation or it was not, not ideal but we feel like at the end of the day we're going to get the thing that we contracted to get. And, and if it turns out that it would be helpful for the board to get engaged in it and we can hear about it and decide. but. Um, that's what we'll do. So. Well, this is why I asked for no intervention. I think we're going to get what we anticipate. We're not going to get it in the time it was promised. And by the same token, um, I don't know that we're going to get what is due to us in the future based on current performance. I think, right. So I, I, yeah. I mean, I just just very quickly. I yes, think sir. if there are serious allegations made against the contractor, serious concerns, that contractor should have the right to speak for themselves. Okay, I'm good with that. All right, we've received direction here, and uh, I'm glad that we we're able to discuss some of the uh, uh, you know, timelines that have not been met and expectations that are uh, currently unmet. But again, we do feel confident that with Climate Tech, they are ultimately delivering the installed goods uh, that we anticipated, although not in the format that we, or timing that we were hoping. But uh, if we could, let's go ahead and move into our brief PowerPoint and move into the conversation uh, again tonight discussing. So let's, and to, be, so be, to be clear about this, we're gonna get information on this now, and then, right, we're not gonna make a decision because it seemed like we just pivoted and talked about putting it in the context of the 35 million and what would have to we'd have to give up. 
Well, that's here in the materials. Oh, right, okay. So I, You're I'm hoping that we can actually get some very clear guidance uh, tonight uh, between these three options, and then we'd actually be bringing back a finalized version of that option in September. I didn't understand what you meant forward. by September. Got it. Yep. Yep. All right. So um, you know, just a reminder, Julie, go into, did we did that skip over one perhaps? Yep. So uh, just a reminder, as that first bullet point, uh, you know, lays out, you know, uh, Josh really uh, built the foundation of our overall bond plan, the, the 35 million in need, um, and R&T and Ron uh, collectively updated it. And so in October 17 is when we did uh, produce that, uh, that general uh, bond program. In that, and Julie can go ahead and jump to the next one. In that, we identified uh, you know, various budgets for the different sites uh, for nutrition services. I realize how small that font is here, but it is in the, the material. So uh, the important piece here is just to know that the, uh, the initial plan for Matillaha's Kitchen was roughly a half a million dollar budget um, with an additional 194000 to be uh, spent on dining hall improvements. Um, Gray can talk to us a little bit about what's changed uh, from thinking that we might be able to get by to you know meet health code requirements, uh, meet the you know DSA, uh, ADA, and structural needs, and be able to get in a half million dollars. What we've done is we've really dived deeper into this project, has realized that that's not a possibility. Um, so the the bare minimum project for us to gain compliance with both health code, again DSA, uh, ADA, and, and, and structural needs. Uh, repairing the areas that we need to, even if we're not actually changing the function of the kitchen, which right now admittedly is quite inefficient uh, and has a number of challenges and limitations, to simply uh, be able to keep our kitchen open at Matillaha, we are looking at uh, nearly a three, well, a project going from 700,000 when you factor in again the half million for the ki uh, kitchen itself and the 194,000 for the dining hall. Now we're looking at something, uh, what we're calling option C, in that 1.3 to 1.5 million dollar range. So right off the bat, we know that this is the first project that we've done that's actually going to be coming in uh, above what those preliminary budget numbers were. Remember, those preliminary budget numbers were, uh, you know, the best work that Ron collectively with R&T were able to to build out to help us understand again what we could accomplish in that 35 million dollar threshold. Um, but by no means was it so exhaustive that they were, you know, doing destructive testing to identify some of the, you know, roof conditions individually, or in this case, you know, the various needs that we had uh, in the kitchen. So as, as we really have to uh, dive deeper, you know, we have seen that uh, this is going to be a larger scope project than we um, initially were uh, creating a line, line Is Matilda for. experiencing, like, health department, like, oh, you, you, you have to make these changes, like, with the pool, or is this just... If we want to do something to the kitchen, we need to spend this to get to bare minimum. Julie, what, the, do you want to talk about just sure. the... Uh... Um, well, the, in the past, the health department has been somewhat lenient with school districts, but now they're um, taking a harsher approach. So if we don't... If we don't meet the the codes of the health department, then eventually in the future we could get shut down. So, um, so we're currently of out of compliance. We receive, you know, anytime they come out, they talk to us about these different things they don't like. Right. Okay. Uh, so they do point out just as with the pool. However, they have been patient, and again, to Julie's credit and Suzanne's prior to her, you know, they uh, have been persuasive in saying, hey, we know that we have these issues, you know, we currently are restrained based on our budget. We have this as a project that we're trying to, you know, invest in through the, the facility bond. And so they have been, as Julie said, lenient, but, um, but, if we didn't but do that's, anything, that's uh, if we don't do anything, we are significantly exposing ourselves to the possibility that we're, we're shut down. You're welcome. So again, the, the project um, at minimum is now looking like 1.3, 1.5. And so uh, Greg, do you want to talk a little bit more about how exactly, you know, in two minutes or so, how we went from that half million to the 1.5, talk about why we had such a significant change. What are the needs just to have that bare minimum option C? Well, basically, we have a building that was completed in 1947, and we're trying to retrofit compliance improvements for meeting fire life safety, ADA, and County of Ventura environmental health 
requirements and the Environmental Health Department oversees food service. The kitchen at Matilla currently has one two compartment sink. Health Department requirements include a three compartment sink for the purpose of washing dishes, a prep sink for the washing of vegetables and such, and then a hand sink. This is just one example to identify your to accommodate this, we have to remove some existing improvements. We have to cut concrete. We have to extend drainage and water, both hot and cold, to accommodate these improvements within a limited space. You're, even a stove in a kitchen has to be ADA accessible in today's world. Presently, there's 23 inches between the knobs on the stove and the adjacent prep counter. There's 60 inches between the stove and the serving counter. So removing that counter, you're still not really fully ADA compliant because you've got, you don't have 72 inches, you've got 60. So this carries through where there's doors that have to be upgraded there's a lot of structural work, there's a lot of saw cutting that have driven up the cost of this to meet current standards in, in a 47 year old building. And So can I ask a specific question, this option B mm -hmm. uh, provides for a new kitchen wing, does that mean destruction new. and new or just? So, Julie, why don't you hop in? So that's really, again, where we're here tonight, is at minimum, we are looking at this project requiring that 1.3 to 1.5. And so uh, we are going to get into what that means. We actually have to look at removing um, as far as things from our $35 million plan. Um, but yeah, I'm sorry, but that's what I thought you said was in here. That's not in here. Right? Yeah, yeah, no, it's two pages following, or okay. three pages following. I couldn't find it. I couldn't find it. Did that not? It's, it's, it was one page before. No, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, it's the very next page that we're. Yep, there it is. So, uh, so right now, first of all, again, okay, I thought we had the whole 35 million. Well, no, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, this, that, that's what I thought you were. Yeah. yeah. This is what he's suggesting we lose in order. Items to from option. which we pull from. Okay. Right. Sorry. Was, I'm, yeah. Yeah, we I'm misunderstood what you're saying. Still hoping for the whole list so we can. Yeah. So. Um, Again, the, at minimum, we're looking at this new price point. And so what we want to bring to you is as we've been meeting with Julie and meeting, you know, talking with our architects and talking to the nutrition service department is, you know, do we take this opportunity knowing now that this is not something that's going to simply be a, you know, quarter million, third of a million dollar project that we're, we are able to uh, simply spruce up similar to the way we were with Topa, where we were able to keep, you know, the footprint we currently had and just, you know, make some changes. Here we are looking at something that's going to be requiring significant investment. And so then Julie started talking about what could happen for what ended up being an extra half a million dollar increase. And so can you just explain mm -hmm. a little bit of what is the difference between that option C, which is just maintaining what we currently have as far as configuration and capacity, to now what option B could be at the extra half million dollar investment? Um, so I'd like to start off by saying that the menu is what drives the design of a kitchen. And so if we continue to stay with option C, then it really doesn't leave room to enhance the current menu that we have. So we'd really be continuing the same food service operation that we're currently doing. With option B, which I believe that the district would greatly benefit from a, having a central food preparation and food storage facility. Um, some of the benefits of option B include increased food productivity. So we'd be able to do larger batch cooking, which would allow us to um, increase the, the meals that we're, we're preparing from scratch or uh, homemade meals. Um, and by preparing scratch meals, we would then increase the nutritional integrity of the foods that we're offering. We'd be able to control um, ingredients that are added into these items, such as sodium, fat, saturated fat, and cholesterol. We'd also have the ability to control the uh, different allergens, such as soy. Um, currently, with the, with the products that I'm receiving from 
the commercial food processors, they add soy to a lot of different products that we uh, are using in our program. And the reason for that is it's a less expensive ingredient and it's also a protein substitute. So this creates a challenge for me when I have to um, provide meal accommodations for students with dietary restrictions. Do we have a lot of, of soy allergic kids? Not a lot, mm -mm. but that's just one example of okay. where it provides limitations. Can I, I just want to understand what that means. So this would be a secondary kitchen so that you could prepare some food in one kitchen and some food in another kitchen? This would be one central kitchen where we would provide, we would prepare um, meals for the elementary school sites. So um, it's one facility. Where so so right what now? we're actually talking about with option B is it becomes, uh, you know, we're actually getting a few things with it. One is uh, central storage um, for all, so we're taking central storage away from what's done currently here at the district office, moving it over there, also adding the ability to do central prep, which drives down labor cost uh, across the other kitchens and enhances the, again, the nutritional value. So it's gonna actually be completely uh, demoing the current kitchen that's there expanding it out by a few feet, uh, you know, uh, increasing the size of the kitchen. So we're increasing our ability to, uh, you know, meet the demand that's currently at Matilha, but really also giving ourselves flexibility down the road, whether or not we move off here and we have to be seeking alternative location for the central storage and central prep, uh, or central storage. Um, but it's ultimately a single kitchen that would be doing two tasks. It'd be making all the product for Matilaha while also having the ability to make all the product for the elementary schools. Um, and then it'd be transported over to the elementary and so elementary becomes responsible for warming and serving as opposed to full uh, meal prep. Although again, right now, a lot of that meal prep is simply warming and serving, but it's processed stuff, you know, processed corn dogs as opposed to something that's from scratch in our kitchens. Where are, where's the most prep right now? At Miners Oaks and, or Nordoff? Or? Um, all of the kitchens currently are, are prepping their own foods except for uh, San Antonio. So that's so, something that was actually, I think that we've communicated in the past that perhaps existed a little bit more in the past, but Julie's helped me understand. You know, we viewed often that Myers Oaks, or we've spoken often of Myers Oaks being our central kitchen. It really actually is not doing a central prep function for any school other than San Antonio in itself. Um, it was doing some as well, but it's not actually doing any of the prep for uh, Topa or Miramani. Um, and the storage, it's serving a minimal function of, uh, of a holding place for storage. What we do is we send over you know, a case of tomato sauce and then they're breaking it down and then sending out that tomato sauce back to the other sites. And so they're, again, serving that intermediary role but not necessarily a true central prep or storage. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to me, I mean, Matilaha students are really much more aware of the fact that their food is not fresh. Um, so Um, so this would also improve the quality of the product that we're preparing. Um, we would have a uniform standard as well as consistency throughout the district and the food would taste better and be more visually appealing because it is made from scratch. Um, this ultimately would increase our meal participation and increase revenue for the district. Some, oh. I'm a little lost, um, so I, I just need a little clarification. Option C was what we originally planned to do, right? and it's just gotten more expensive. Exactly. So when we barely had enough money for everything that we need, we picked this as the minimum that we needed to do at Matilaha. It's now going to cost us more, and we're discussing spending even more. That's exactly correct. Okay. So as we have already you know, exceed the budget, we are having to look at where we're going to pull budget from. And that's exactly, again, the, the conversation I want you guys to engage in is uh, if we, you know, let's just jump ahead just so because there has been conversation around budget and what might need to go. Uh, you can see on the next page, page 7 of 18 on your slides, that for example, we had 3.25 uh, million 
allocated for solar at the elementary sites. That's not including solar at uh, Nordoff or Matillaha. And so what you know, Greg and I have been reviewing, and, and Dave Rogers as well, is that the value of solar is diminishing significantly, uh, not just because of the tariffs and increased cost of actually getting solar panels installed, but more significantly that for the first time, uh, Edison is actually introducing a new lower cost period during the instructional day for the majority of our months, uh, of instructional months from October to May, is it? Yes. So uh, what people are looking at, you know, he's been consulting with uh, other school districts that have solar, is that the, you know, uh, the payback already was longer than, you know, it ever shows in projections. And now with this movement by Edison is that it's looking like solar has even a longer payback. Combine that with the elementary sites already were going to be a, a longer payback period because they're lower users. And so, you know, if you're installing, making the connections, having to, again, tear up the concrete in a parking lot to make the connection for a panel to the, the main electrical panel, um, whether or not you have... I'm going to use layman terms for myself uh, as much as for you guys. You know, if you have 10 panels up there meeting your need, uh, there's no greater cost to have 20 panels up there when it comes to having to tear out that parking lot and make that connection. You know, so economies of scale clearly come when you have a, a bigger solar field that you're, you're utilizing. And so the elementary schools were looking like a, a slow payback as it was. The cost of solar has become more expensive, and the cost of our alternative, our current Edison, is becoming cheaper. And so we believe that actually Edison, or that our uh, PV plan at all five sites, including Summit, perhaps can be revisited, and that that might be a place where we're pulling budget. And if we are going to talk about that and pull, pull budget from some of the PV projects, then you know, do we feel that there's enough value in option B versus option C, where we're not going to simply pull the budget from one site and just focus on four sites, but it doesn't make sense to pull budget from two sites, focus on three, elementary sites potentially, or again, we actually are getting more and more of the opinion that maybe no sites at the elementary level make sense. But does that make sense as far as that's what we're doing? Is we're going through that exercise. We know that we're having to pull budget somewhere. Pulling budgets causing us to reevaluate the overall, you know, some of these overall line items as to whether or not they were properly budgeted or properly needed in the first place. So another uh, example of something that, while it was needed, was not, you know, uh, properly budgeted is the Nordoff High School new camera upgrades, that's the midpoint of this list. That was uh, budgeted at 260, is that right? That's correct. Came in at about 40,000, that's Dave Rogers and his team coming up with a very innovative way of not having to rewire the whole campus, which would have been the more expensive one. So we've actually saved $220,000 uh, of budget from there, and so that would be another place that we start pulling budget from to be able to, uh, you know, that is available budget currently. So. Again, that, and you can see some other things like uh, Ron had maintained a priority that Ron or that uh, Josh had for safety fencing and perimeter security fencing at Matillaha. So far, I haven't heard from uh, the community of, of, at, of Hull or this board of having a real desire to begin fencing off our entire campuses. Nor do I actually, as I you know, investigate the price of fencing, do I think that sixty-seven thousand would have been sufficient to do it. So, well, and Chief Fryanoff advised us against it. That's exactly yeah. right. So that would be another place where we start pulling some budgets. Now we start scraping budget from some different projects, and we're able to have it go toward, uh, toward, uh, you know, a few different options at Matilla. But I'll be honest. I mean, this is a going from one point five up to two million is a luxury. Uh, it is not something that we must do in order to keep the kitchen open. It's something that we could do to give ourselves flexibility in a number of ways, again, for labor and for storage going forward, as well as really innovate and have something that I think, and that's one of the reasons that we want to make sure Lori knew about this presentation was something that we think. <laughs> we do appreciate, appreciate that. that. But, you know, that's obviously something that very much aligns with what Food for Thought has been, you know, collaborating with our district on for a number of years of really trying to, uh, you know, increase the nutritional value of food options in our uh, uh, school nu nutrition program without it having to completely drive up costs to the point where we can't afford to run, you know, the general operating budget of the program. So taking this to invest in new uh, um, uh, equipment as well as a, a new you know configuration and opportunity in this kitchen does give us that long-term ability to do something without having it just 
you know, completely blow out our operational budget. But the reason that we're able to even have this conversation is because there's at least one big ticket item that's probably not going to pencil out. That's exactly right. Okay. Exactly and which right. of these have already not happened? Like the new camera upgrades, we already have digital seen Digital signage things, is right? already in there. That's exactly right. So digital signage digital is another sign one that was, none yeah. of that, or that 52,000 is fully available. Okay. The 220 is fully available, so we're at 272 right there. Um, the other ones have not uh, not been. The other ones still uh, need decisions. Still need decisions, exactly. Okay. But our budget really went from five million to one and a half million. So. 500,000. 500,000. 500,000 to 1.5 million. Based at least. Yeah. Right. right, right. So we're already a million behind. That's right. Well, we are a million behind that initial number. The first place that we pull to bridge that gap is the 195,000 that's currently allocated for the uh, dining area improvements. Uh, because we are, that hasn't been mentioned yet, but in option C or B, uh, we're talking about uh, meeting all structural needs of uh, the dining hall as well as adding air conditioning. And so it'd be the for current. For half the students. So up to half, yeah. Up well, to half could fit there, but the other half. That's right. Well, it's like a normal, you know, that's what I was going to ask about just the behavior of the kids over there in terms right. of. It doesn't seem like when I've been there that that many kids go inside, but of course when it's no. air conditioned, it that's right. adds yeah. a new thing. But when and it also well, becomes when it a, a potential site for right. other. But if it ever rains. Sure, and that's other when I've heard that the kids use it. Otherwise, it's kind of empty. Yeah. But when it rains, its capacity is about ninety right now, and they shove right. about one hundred and twenty in there. <laughs> I guess my my first question though about this is why Matillaha um, for a central kitchen? I mean, it seems like all these things have just hit us all at once. Okay. I the central kitchen idea sounds fine. You know, we need to improve Matillaha. That sounds fine. But is it just because we're looking at Matillaha and thinking, oh, as long as we're doing this, let's do it? Or have we looked at the other sites and thought, hey, what would it take to do a central kitchen somewhere else? Do you want to talk about that, Julie? So we, with the architects, we did do a walkthrough of Miner's Oaks, and the current facility doesn't really allow for expansion. And so that was, um, or redesigning of the, of the, um, concept inside the kitchen. Um, Miner's Oaks is a very inefficient kitchen as far as having all of the cooking equipment in the center of the kitchen and having to walk all around it. Um, it creates a, an inefficient flow, workflow for the staff. And so when speaking with the, with the architects, they um, determined that there really wasn't going to be much flexibility to change that. Plus, we have to do something at Matilla anyway right. because mm -hmm. of the health department. Mm -hmm. That's I mean, right. That's and where it started. So th that's we're certainly not in compliance. Matilla has started, one, because we're, we need to make improvements, and two, because we really felt, you know, that this is a year of transition for the school. Far better for us to try to get this completed before the sixth grade moves when we know demand is going to increase at that site, we already have issues when it comes to the queue. You know, a student, we've heard from you, Shelley, about, you know, the that being a reality of why our participation numbers there are lower is that we already are struggling to get kids through line quick enough. And now we're talking about adding a 50% increase to the, the population. So we wanted to really, you know, we're going to be making changes here. We need to, timing-wise, it makes sense to try to get this accomplished before we have even more issues when the sixth grade comes. And so that was certainly timing-wise why we were looking at Matillaha, but as Julie said, we did walk with uh, R&T looking at each of the elementary sites, and they really didn't feel that they actually had the ability for that expansion. Whereas Matillaha, if you can picture the cafeteria, there is that, that you know, where currently we have some staff parked during the school day, but there is that room between the cafeteria and the, uh, that, you know, yeah. So this option B will improve the flow of students getting food? Yes which I'm happy to discuss if you'd like to move forward. Um, so this is the design of the kitchen. <laughs> Can you go to the next slide? So it's an enlarged version. Okay, perfect. Um, so as I walk through the design, huh? oh. um, as I walk through the design, I'm going to refer to the flow of food. And what that means is, um, the, the way we handle the food from when it's received 
all the way to when it's served. And there's three different stages with the flow of food. There's the, um, the food storage area. There's also the food prep area. And then there's the food service area. So over here on the west end of the building, this is where deliveries will occur. And then the food is then transported inside the food storage area. Here we have a temperature controlled dry storage um, area where it, it is control, temperature controlled by the air conditioning, uh, which helps with uh, the quality of the product. And then we also have two cold storage units. We have a freezer unit and we also have a refrigeration unit. So um, food is then transferred into the food prep area. And in this area, it's kind of divided into two sections. Over here we have um, where staff would process fresh fruits and vegetables. And then on the other side of the kitchen, we have the cook line and this is where all of the cooking equipment is located. So once the food is processed and cooked, then we, have, we are either going to be placing food back into cold storage where it's then gonna be transported um, to the satellite kitchens or it will then be transferred to the food service area. Students will walk in through this door into the food service area where they can grab cold beverages and a cold entree. And if that's all they're interested in, or a snack as well, and um, then they can en exit through this first door where the first point of sale is located, and they'll exit into the cafeteria. If a student wants a hot lunch, then they'll continue down the service line where they'll pick um, a hot entree and then exit the second point of sale into the cafeteria. And then this room is reserved for uh, dishwashing. So we have a separate room for that. And then over here on this end of the building is reserved for custodial supplies and uh, cleaning products. What is the whole square footage of this? No. Greg, what's it go up to? Four, I want to say 1,400 square feet. Is that not accurate? And, and this dining room is the existing room. For plan you know, B. Mm -hmm. If so, we were to go with the full-blown Cadillac A, um, I presume we have to work with, well, do we have to work with architects for all this? Yeah. I mean, yes. this is like a. Oh yeah. This yes. is a. DSA year, is going to be a year ahead project, two year project. No, we still are certainly in the kitchen. If we went with B, we are still believing it's going to be a tight timeline, but it's done before sixth grade moves. We finish it before uh, Sorry, yeah. August of of uh, nineteen. The dining hall. If we did go to that Cadillac option, if you want to say uh, of uh, option A. Um, architects just share with us their you know growing concern for the ability for us to have that fully completed in August um, but we you know we're still right there you know we might be pushing into the first couple of weeks of school if we're not able to move it quickly which is one of the reasons why we're bringing this forward now and wanting some direction then we'll bring back a more complete plan uh, on September 4th based on the feedback we received tonight because if we can move forward quick enough you know, the architects have been working on this for six months trying to build out the project. So I was, I was going to say, you know, one thing that's really neat about this coming up now is just because we're consolidating so many students at Matillaha right. and where Matillaha stands as a school in a declining enrollment district, right. um, you know, it'd be kind of cool to imagine maybe a little performing space in there and having this new kind of something similar to the stage that they have over at Nordoff or something more intimate. You can imagine maybe people playing some music during lunch. That's right. It could be kind of cool. Yeah, exactly. So, so this pushes out to the north side, right? This. That's right. So and right then how much does it added, actually extend? Right now we probably have like something. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. If I may, more and more. to answer Mr. Whipple's earlier question, Matilla was selected because the existing kitchen is approximately 1,100 square feet. Yeah, the kitchen at uh, Miramonte is 575 square feet. 
and Miners Oaks is 944 square feet. So it was the largest to begin with and it has the greatest opportunity for expansion. This proposed uh, new kitchen, the footprint grows to approximately 1,300 square feet. It's not that much more, but the efficiencies that new construction allows, plus upgrades to those hidden costs like new drainage, new water supply lines, etc. So, uh, so yeah, that's timeline where we are. Uh, these are the, the projects. And so, again, 1.5 million is the option C. Uh, option B that Julie's talked about brings us up to 2 million. And if we do want to discuss, if we're you know doing this whole construction project, if we want to take this opportunity to expand out the actual indoor, you know, as, as Kevin was talking about, really a multi-use space similar to what Nordoff has with its uh, cafe dining hall, being able to have a climate-controlled space where not just students can uh, congregate or eat at lunch, but also where, uh, you know, we've talked about, you know, does the pancake breakfast or other things uh, transition from Chaparral to uh, to Matilha as it becomes again more of a central uh, hub of uh, both a really excellent kitchen as well as um, you know a good indoor space for for multi-use. Um, so those are again uh, we haven't built out that op the really option A again that would be something that architects work on over the coming weeks. The basic idea right now though would be that we'd be keeping the same uh, um, current building and really expanding out uh, um, to the east and to the uh, primarily to the uh, the west but potentially also to the east and so being able to keep that same roof line and the same you know windows that you can see from you know Matilla Avenue and so it's doubling the space of the uh, dining hall uh, by having it uh, longer than it would be you know wide but um, if the the board doesn't want to entertain again making some tough calls on uh, reducing other areas of budget, then we're not going to have our architects spend money designing. So um, going back to how can we get any of these projects accomplished? So we've we've shown you um, you know the the current budget for kitchens. We don't believe there's that much area to carve out. So I'm now on page six of eighteen of your materials. We don't believe there's that much uh, budget to reduce from uh, from here. The one, play, the one exception would be at Topa Topa, you can see that they actually intend to do a two-phased schedule of the kitchen improvement initially. Um, there's no longer need, even if we don't go to a prep kitchen, for this second line item under Topa of $260,000. So that is funds that are flexible to be moved over for nutrition services. What was that going to entail, that second phase we, that we're not doing? We believe it was when we initially, you know, remember the scope ended up changing pretty significantly with Ron as it was moving forward. Um, and so I believe that they were initially trying to tackle the, the first phase without doing the actual vent and then roof and those things. And now we, we've taken care of all of our, again, health code needs as well as we've taken care of any other, uh, you know, compliance issues there, ADA and, and otherwise. So we have 260 there without changing any of the budgets to nutrition services. Again, you can see, though, as the whole, we have roughly $2 million of the $35 million bond committed to uh, um, kitchens across the district. Uh, going to that next page, if you pull out solar, really all of these other projects and some... I'm sorry, could you, you said roughly $2 million, we're looking at one point one. Two million is okay. the actual subtotal of the budget. 1.2 is it. what's available after you take out the, you know, what we with certainty can't pull away from, which is either the funds already expended on TOPA or on the known improvements we need to do at Nordoff. Got it. Okay. So if you move to this next slide, again, that we've already talked about a bit, but you see that we have 4.2 million listed here. Uh, pulling out solar for now, if you just look at the others, that leaves 950,000. Outdoor campus lighting really has been pretty significantly taken care of at Nordoff by the Climatech program, and we don't, uh, currently the site's not uh, feeling that they need any further lighting for security or otherwise at the campus. And How is so it uh, helped by climate tech? They replaced all of our lighting, made sure everything's working, and then unified it. So if you, go by, oh, if you go by many of our campuses, they do look different at night wow. now because of the, uh, the, the you know. Work. What's that? Because the lights actually work. <laughs> <laughs> right. And uh, the library isn't something you're going to be getting new... 
Right, with the library renovation at Nordoff, they're going to be improving the lighting in the center sure. of the campus. Sure, right, exactly, yeah. right. So, uh, you know, again, if you just go down this list of items, even pulling out PV, the kitchen uh, roof, obviously that's part of this project. And so that, that was a separate line item in our budget, but that's obviously available for us here. Safety fencing, we believe that that's not something that we want to keep in the budget, but again, I'm putting forward that to you uh, this time. Expand dining hall, obviously that's covered under this program. The would new that only be required if we did it the option C? We would still need covered dining area at Matilla well, if we did option C, no? You're right. Uh, option C still includes uh, climate control in that uh, dining hall. <coughs> And right. it includes improving the dining hall. So you're right that we would still need uh, have need for shade. However, there's no way that I would be bringing forward to you the uh, any sort of uh, um, structural shade options. It would be looking at things that actually Matilha is already working on with the PTA as well as OEF and a few others on some of those uh, um, shade, sales. shade sales. Exactly, it'd be that sort of shade structure. If we so it wouldn't be this 195. Right, really that 195 we're saying needs to go into the actual improvements to that dining hall regardless. Which well, even is, but without not, that, we're already at 654. What's that? Even without that 195,000, just adding up the other one, two, three, four, five items, I'm at 654,000. Uh, I think we're even higher than that, right? We have, um, without the 195. We have, without the 3.25, we're at right. uh, 950. Thousand. Right. So you take away one ninety five. So, so we're at about seven fifty. Yeah. Come on, little phone. <laughs> <laughs> and what about some trees along the there? Like not oak trees, but <laughs> so that area doesn't have to be covered. That it's just just naturally shaded. As right far outside the dining right, that's what I'm saying. Is exactly if we if we're not going to this type of a option for expanding our actual indoor eating, if we're talking about really just creating some shade, then it is using either those sails or using uh, natural you know trees and other means. But it's not going to be um, something significant otherwise. Exactly structure. So again, the point being here is that we can carve out the money to get us to that 1.5 without touching solar if if you guys are open to those other items that are on this list. If we are open to considering not having all five of our elementary sites uh, slated to receive solar, then instantly budget options open up considerably here. But not all for a kitchen necessarily. No. I mean, there are other things no, that, that are on million. our list that, That's right. that we may need more money for as we find our buying power eroding. Absolutely correct. So have we considered where else we might need extra money if we free up these funds, have I'm we thinking specifically of a pool? But, you know, there may be other <laughs> yeah. things, right? Sure. Um, I'm not. I mean, you know what I'm saying? It's like because we can free up money uh, doesn't automatically tell me we need to spend it. I love the idea of a central kitchen. I love the option B because I, I like improving and, and all of that, and I think that's a good thing. But I, I, as we go on for more, I am, I'm wondering, well, well, there are other projects that we might need extra money because everything's going to come in more expensive than we anticipated almost. Right. So Although they've done a good job of cutting costs. Absolutely. But, I, but I, you're, the principle you're, <laughs> is I totally agree with. So again, I, I want to make sure we're all on the same page. The feedback I've received from each of you is that you like the greater participation. You don't necessarily want a perfectly bow wrapped, uh, you know, uh, item put before you. It's simply for ratification. So that really is tonight is not me advocating for option A. Um, if you want to know my opinion, I actually think B is is probably the uh, best path. But I want to give you know everyone an option to to weigh in on. You know, we at minimum need to go 1.5. Do we think you know how do we prioritize? And I've heard around this table in the past that we do want to prioritize uh, some sort of expanded options for climate controlled or just some shaded or whatever it might be, but give students an opportunity to um, not have to either eat in classrooms or in the 110 degree heat or in the rain or whatever it might be. And so that was the idea here is asking you guys for that feedback. But Mike, you're right. I mean, perhaps you guys feel that 
a pool, although that's going to be a four million dollar line item, whereas this we're talking about a half million dollar each, and so you know it, there is a difference in an opportunity so cost there. But here and half a million here, pretty soon you're talking real money. Absolutely. Right. That's so there's there's three million in solar that you're kind of telling us it's probably not going to pencil out cost effectively. Um, you know, three million on top of what's budgeted for the pool is a significant amount of money. Absolutely correct. Um, Absolutely. So, and I'm not saying to do that. I'm just saying, um, yeah, it's half a million, but each half a million makes a difference. Um, and my recollection is that what we talked about with the pool was we weren't exactly sure what we were going to get for what was budgeted because of the extent of the repairs just to bring it up to baseline. Mm -hmm. That's right. What so, do we budget for the pool? Do you remember? I think it's like around six hundred thousand. That's accurate. Six hundred thousand is what's in the bond plan. The minimum cost that when we've scoped out what it would take to actually build a new complex, new pool, no, yeah. uh, would be in that three to five million, but probably closer to five than three, depending on what options we wanted to, to give it. You know, is it Villanova's pool versus oh, yeah. Besson or? But in terms of what we've got budgeted right now, because we've got the whole thirty-five sort of. In places, what did we put for the pool? Six hundred. Six hundred. Can you reiterate the thing about what Southern Cal Edison has done for the daytime? Is that just schools, or what do you? Do you want to talk about that? During the meeting with uh, Oxnard Union High School District about the benefits of a solar program, they received an announcement from Southern California Edison that. Southern California Edison is introducing new off-peak rates to be effective Monday through Friday, excuse me, all week, all days, between the hours of 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. Wow. And it was runs peak. for the months. I thought that was peak, too. That's when you're not supposed to do your walk. Well, we'll get to that. <laughs> um, it, it's from October through May, which is most of our business year. Uh, exactly. And it takes effect in March of 2019. So when I was with Ms. Marianne LaRue, the energy manager for the high school district, she said, well, this just extended out our payback to an undeterminable amount of time, these, these new low rates. And her counsel was, as Andy stated, the smaller school sites the, the payback isn't there because our demand isn't that great. And if I may, regarding the idea of a central kitchen, all your students are going to find their way to that middle school. And just like in a home, the kitchen is the heart of that school. Whether or not they enter that dining area, they're getting some meal that was prepared there. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. It's a difficult decision, and money doesn't grow on trees. But these improvements would create an adaptable space if you go with the Cadillac. You go option A. You go all in. You have a dining room that will have a capacity of 200 students. You will have an adaptive space for a testing space, a meeting space, as Andy said, pancake breakfast space. This is a demonstrated commitment to the sustainability of Matillaha going forward as your middle school. This is a wonderful opportunity. I sincerely hope you embrace it. Can you tell me about the capacity of the dining hall part? If uh, I'm hearing 200, I see here 180. And is that capacity or is that actually they can it's sit dining. down and eat? That's, That's dining. dining. The assembly is like 300 and okay. yeah. low 300s for assembly. Okay, seating. so it is dining for 180. Yes. Right. I'm interested in exploring all the options, but I want to know what we're trading. I, I think that's the, and we have a few things here, but as was mentioned, we're, there are a lot of things that aren't here that, that we might be foregoing. 
So you mean, we, you mean everything else that's not on the current list? Is that like a pool, a full new pool, or what do you mean when you say there are other things not yeah, on the list? Yeah, I mean, a, a pool, I, we were talking about different library options. We're talking about, you know, there's another $20 million worth of stuff around the district. So you're and saying what's already in the 35? What's already in the 35? What, what else could we make better? I mean, it's, it's like... We, we discussed the library. You know, first we were just going to re-roof it. And then it came back with a bigger plan. Okay, this will be so much better. Great, I'm all for a better library, but we're, we're taking these decisions kind of in abstract. And, and so it's great to advocate. This is a wonderful project. I'm all for it. It's exciting. I love the central kitchen. I love I room. It can be a theater, it could be, you know, whatever else, but our, you know, what, what else are we giving up? And what else is on the list that's going to be impacted? What, as far as other things, on, well, I hear you saying thing and I'll see what we can do to get, uh, you know, a fuller picture for you guys before that September 4th meeting. I mean, and, and solar, I'm... You know, there's the financial consideration, but I think a lot of people would say it's not just about money. It, it's about renewable energy. And, you know, what, what really is a break-even? Are we talking about a 20-year break-even now? Or 20 you know, is what was previously before increased cost of solar and the reduced so rate of medicine. So now it's beyond 20. We were looking at a 5 to 6 percent IRR on on that investment so it's it's now lower but Nordoff still makes sense or maybe not we're... necessarily uh, and, and the guidance I'm getting from others is no it doesn't right. but I didn't want to go so radical to eliminate solar from our entire bond well, right now are, and so we are going back to revisit right the, we're, we're the calculations fully... once we have September and October bills reflecting the new lighting which reduces wattage by two-thirds and the roofing that added insulation. So that is not being kicked to the curb, if you will. And this may be premature and I may be sideways with you, <laughs> but looking forward to 2020 and 2025, when projects that were completed in the early 2000s cycle back into eligibility for state aid, my proposal to you is that I start now identifying the pro the buildings by site and when their eligibility comes up and we posture to capture those funds that are over the horizon but will allow this district to move forward. For the sake of conversation, we have approximately a million dollars to seal the asphalt at the high school. Greg, we are jumping a bit ahead, so I'm going to pick up there that. and we'll, okay. we'll, we'll get back to the board on, on those details. Okay. But What is the amount that's in solar in the $35 million? I see what it is for the elementary, but what was the total? The total amount was 5.7. Five, five, uh, okay, 5.7 million. So uh, it still holds out the 2.5 million for the uh, secondary. So to be clear, the issue before us right now is a, a general direction that will then give rise to an action item in September? Or a potential action item if you guys were feeling that you had enough information at that time. To, so again, for instance, right now we've done nothing to build out Concept A as far as an expanded dining hall. If you guys tell us that you really aren't interested in us you know, devoting even more money to a project that already was beyond budget, then we weren't going to, again, commission our architects to work on that. But if you say that, hey, we, we do have some real interest, we do see that as a being a, a need, you know, again, a need for the multiple purposes that it can bring, then we will work between now and, and uh, September 4th on preparing something more definite for you. Well, I was just going to share, start that. So, so I am definitely behind option B, without a doubt. Um, Option A, I'm leaning against, but I could also be convinced to say, well, do we, we have a guesstimate of how much we would pay the architects, 30000 or to sort of flesh out option A for us? 
I don't have an estimate, no. Um, rule of thumb, allow 15% of the cost of, of the project. Of that five million or half a million to add the extended the, dining. The full room. design, but to give us just something a little bit more conceptual than more some more words on page, I'm sure less, less than that. Yeah. <laughs> Shelly? I, w I was going to speak to Thane's um, argument for solar and that it's not always about the money. Sometimes it's about the environmental impact. And while I agree with that, I, um, I also think teaching kids to eat real food instead of the processed food leaps and bounds beyond solar. It's not as pretty. It doesn't catch the eye necessarily of the community, but I think that is so, so important, um, even more environmentally than solar, necessarily. So um, I appreciate that option, but I think we need, a, we need a kitchen that cooks real food. I think that would be absolutely amazing. Um, and as to the pool idea, I, I really think that the district if we had seed money to go towards that, I think it needs to be um, in conjunction with the city. It needs to be fundraised. I think people in the community need buy-in for that. And so I'm not looking to free up this, these larger pockets of money in order just to go to a swimming pool. I think that two million as opposed to four or five would be great to start getting support behind a pool. Um, so I'm not so opposed to putting it into option A. I think the kids there, you know, when I think about Matillaha and the spaces that are available, we do have the auditorium, which is not, you can't move the seats. It's not, you can't change that at all. Right. It's set, it, it doesn't, um, not terribly conducive to a classroom use. It's a theater. Um, and the only other space I can think of is the library, which has very small pockets of space that aren't able to be used for something else. I'm trying to think but, well, of where. Well, the gym, but. And the gym. But I'm thinking of, of other places that classrooms could use or small groups could collaborate to do a project. I can't think of other spaces on that campus where that is available. So that's part of my, sorry, um, my leaning toward option A is to offer the campus not just a dining hall where kids can get out of the heat and get out of the rain, but also as a, a more um, dynamic space that can be used. Well, it's interesting because nowhere in the district do we have a cafeteria where people go inside and eat. I mean, they're, right? Yeah, nor do well, nor do yeah. they actually eat in there? No. Huh? But the elementary. Well, Topa has a space. Yeah, they have spaces, but not so inside. does Miramar. And... Yeah, everywhere but uh, San Antonio has, well, I was about to say everywhere. Myers Oaks, Matilla, and Topa have shade structures, as well as Summit. Uh, Matilla and San Antonio are the two that don't have a real, don't have shade structures and also do not have uh, indoor options that are at least being utilized. Well, even in Topa, you, you only eat in the cafeteria if you go and get a hot lunch. Otherwise, you stay in your classroom. There's not enough room for everyone who's supposed to be taking lunch. Do they ever so, eat in the cafeteria at Topa? No. Yeah. I don't think so. Topa, they don't eat in there. They don't no. eat ever. They, they would be practically so impossible. The but they have a structure. structure. Yeah. It's oh, so they eat to... there, they just go to the classroom for recess? Are you talking about like on a rainy day? Yeah. Um, yeah, they go back to the classrooms and eat and play there. Yeah, yeah that's, that's what I mean. Okay. That's what we're talking about. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Which is no fun for teachers. No, <laughs> no. But the space we're talking about would only, for seating, would only be enough for half the school. That's right. So it wouldn't be that different than Topa or Miners Oaks. Well, and it would be that's a, a big difference from what we offer now. Right now, it's oh, only it's a, a lot better than nothing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's very small. We don't accommodate kids at all in, in the rain at 
tell her. I, I'm all for doing something. I just, I just, well, I'll just say it again. I just don't like the idea of doing these things piecemeal. So can you say, though, that you're behind option B, or no, not until you get the whole list? Well, uh, option B looks great to me. Yeah. Uh, option A looks good to me, too. Um, option C, I... Not excited about it, but I'm. I'm. But again, I'm just really concerned about the choices we make, and you know, I. I think you've done a really nice job at showing us how we can get there using these things, um, but it's you know. What are the what are we missing out? You know, what's what's the rest of the picture? That's that's my concern. And we're we're talking about spending what two if we do option A, that's two million dollars more than we planned on spending. Uh, almost one point eight because again we have the two hundred thousand four expanded dining right. shade. So I'm I'm not saying I'm against it. I, I've just felt for a long time that we're making decisions in a vacuum on all of these things. Um, I'm leaning toward B. Um, I like the idea of a central kitchen. I think the operational efficiencies are worth pursuing, uh, not to mention the increased quality of the food. Um, you know, everything is better if you spend more money, <laughs> right? So I think that every single thing on that list mm -hmm. We could do better if we spent more, um, but there's a limit, uh, and we all know that the bond was less than a third of what we needed to begin with. Um, I agree with Shelley. I don't think we're going to pay for a, a whole brand new pool all by ourselves, but I think the more money we can, you know, pull together here, the better our chances of potentially attracting other financing as well. And I do have to go back, and, and perhaps I'm misremembering, but. My recollection of the conversations about the condition of the pool and what we had set aside for it was that that, that was probably a joke, um, that 600000 in terms of what needs to be done just to satisfy the, the county, um, not to rebuild it, right, to just rehab it. Mm -hmm. I, I, my recollection is that that was going to be a push with that budget. Um, and I, I could be misremembering. Um, but that being said, there may be other projects as well as we as we go down the line that could benefit from some enhanced funding. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not inclined to just like blow it all, even if we can recover some stuff like because we don't think solar is necessary or effective at the elementaries. We can recover some revenue. I don't think we need to spend it all on the first thing that comes in front of us, um, even though it would be great, right? Because um, Chevy works just like a Cadillac. Um, and so maybe good enough is good enough. So that's kind of where I am with B. So. I think I'm inclined to A. Um, I kind of feel like Measure J is expected by the community to give rise to some um, decidedly better facilities in, in at least some limited respects. I'm very confident that the library at Nordoff is going to be perceived as a really big step forward and a real, maybe even a tractor for people who otherwise might go to a different school. And I think Matillaha is increasingly a hub for the district. And just as Shelley went through the available other resources, just imagine, especially in this common core world we're in, uh, a teacher can send the kids into that space. They can all, you know, be at different tables working. Uh, in air conditioning, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a situation that's not otherwise available. I remember uh, one time um, Jim got one of those awards where they had the, you know, kind of a pancake breakfast, breakfast kind of thing in the current space there, and it's just, you know, it's just not, it's not great. And, and so I, I feel like as long as we're covering the true triage in the district, I mean, we clearly have got all the roofs in order. We're 
you know, the, the triage, the ADA, the stuff that we have to do when we land on a project like this at a central hub, uh, spending 500, well, I think we're all in agreement generally that we at least spend the two million, not to, so that we can have fresh um, stretch cooked meals and, um, and the other benefits. So then going up another 500 for another space in our district to me makes sense. Um, and I know we're not voting on it now, but I certainly think it makes enough sense to do what it would take to learn more about it. Does option B not include uh, air conditioning? For it does. Okay. It just doesn't include the expansion to double the size. But option A, B, and C all have air conditioning and the structural improvements necessary for the, the space as it currently exists. And option B does not exclude the expanded covered dining area for 195. I'm sorry? Right. I mean, you have a, this project here for an expanded covered dining area at Patilla for 195000 I mean, uh, we, on the other, if we do option B, mm -hmm. that doesn't eliminate that, right? Um, again, d if the decision is that we're comfortable pulling some funding away from solar, then right, by all means, there still is. So there's still be the option to have at least, uh, this is not air conditioned indoor seating. That's right. right. This is the shaded seating. So there's, there would still be funding to do something. Yeah, correct. So, okay, so to be clear, the what Mike, Mike's talking about, that that is an outdoor area that's being envisioned there. Right, that would yeah. absolutely be outdoor. Got it. So if you went with the, with, with option B, you would come in a give or take 300,000 less. You could potentially have B combined with the outdoor right. area, and then you'd have an outdoor area. And then you, but, the, but what would be the improvements in the actual seating area right now? Almost none, just a new roof? Structural air conditioning floor covering, removing the existing tables that are set into the floor, new tables that are movable. Like what Nordoff has. Room. And that's, and that's, uh, and it would seat then 90 people for meals? Yes. You know, Kevin, when you put it that way, I'm, I'm interested then in hearing about it, because it's like, well, this is 2 million, but with the extra, it's 2.2. Right. And now this is 2.5, so we might as well just look at it. it um, the marginal is 500 to get to A, right? And, right, and, but if and, you add... And, and there's 200 here that we wouldn't have to spend if we do A. That's right. right. That's right, exactly. So the marginal isn't 500 now. Now it's down to 3 or less. That's right. And I think... And that's then you've got different. a whole new thing. That's different. And it's, you know, at least the things we do, we do really well. Right. Triage plus that seems right. to me like the way you... Tell your constituents that you use their well, money. This is well. another way to offset that cost. This I mean, we all know that the data. the gazebo is our prime. <laughs> thing, but so, is I there joke. any talk the about having a salad bar there? Um, there's definitely potential to have something. You know, a lot of kids have been asking for that at Matilda. A salad bar. Instead of and the teachers too. prepared salads, because we currently make fresh prepared salads. Hmm. That's a good question, though. How much? What I don't. I guess bar? I shouldn't believe everything I hear. <laughs> <laughs> so then, yeah. so direction I'm hearing is uh, for us to uh, continue building out concept B to have it, you know, because that is distinct as far as the kitchen component. I'm hearing uh, whether or not we want to take a formal vote, but a willingness to have an actual firm project coming back on a central prep, central uh, storage facility at Matilla. The question is, and you want more information and, and potentially some drawings of what it is going to truly look like to build out that uh, expanded dining hall. And that's what we'll be coming to in September. With the the bond program that shows you know where where else could this money potentially be allocated or what you know what are what other options could we even be pulling from to to gain comfort with the, the scope and the budget and i would be interested to know what the outside area could look like as well because if fewer than half the students can fit inside where are the other students going to eat what does that look like is it you know is it are they the shade sales or or is it trees or just tables that we have out there? What, what does the whole package look like? Sure. 
we'll have that in September. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Julie and Greg, thank you very much. Thanks thank you. for thank you. staying for the late hour. Thank you all. So we move on to 7.4.2, Infinity Communications uh, contract. We're uh, just renewing a contract we've already been um, in for since 2016, right? That's right. I'll move to approve the contract. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Moving on to 7.5.1. That's the second reading of our 2017 October CSBA recommended board policies. Uh, before we do that, uh, okay, so 8.1. I'll wait till 8.1, Chuck. Uh, so, the uh, second reading, anyone? Are there any comments or do you want a motion? It, I was asking, does anyone have any comments? No? No, I don't. Uh, everyone ready to approve? I'll move to approve. I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And so we move to. Uh, the, uh, the big one 7.5.2 <laughs> the conflict of interest code of the district we're asked to adopt the conflict of interest code anyone like to discuss or to move on it i'll move to adopt the resolution i'll second all in favor aye, aye. 7.5.3 board, board self uh, evaluation i'd like to move that to another night uh, i would concur anyone I have no that. <laughs> so we'll move that Five. forward. And so we're at 7.5.4, uh, amendment of the superintendent's contract uh, to push it out another year. Um, what? So it's a four-year four contract? That's right. Right, four-year. So it would be a four-year contract. Anyone want to discuss um, it? I'll second. All in favor? Right. Just one question. Oh, you very strategic, strategic guy. guy. <laughs> oh, very damn strategic HR guy. Have it. This point. No, no, because I stuck I'm my foot in this I'm last kidding. time, <laughs> so I just want to be sure. This is in a regular cycle, right? This is the normal time at which we would make this decision? That's right, following the evaluation, right. right. And, and just to speak to that, I think, to our credit, we didn't want to link it to his evaluation so that it would be already on an agenda where we were also evaluating him on the same evening because right, it right, seemed right. premature. So, right. yes. I need a clarification. I heard a second from Jane, but I didn't hear the I Sorry. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimously supported by your board. Thank you very much. Uh, superintendent's report. Well, I will thank you uh, for that vote of confidence and the extension of my contract. Um, I was reminded when reviewing the minutes last week that Kathy put together that I had made a promise of uh, some uh, worthy comments on the one year anniversary of my moving into this role, but I am sensing uh, the uh, end of the night upon us, and so I once again will uh, defer the brief. I will sure? defer those comments for another meeting. You sure. I'm sure. They all seem to go till 930. <laughs> <laughs> Any board That's member? That's what uh, our president is. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm the king of it. Come on. <laughs> Any board members? Um, moving on to items for future agenda. I think we probably can hold off till September. And then now uh, 8.1 human resources and we have a speaker. Chuck. <laughs> Actually, looks. Chuck, just right before you start, yes. I was um, thinking maybe on the parking lot there's a couple we could strike, so maybe the next time we'll talk about it. Okay. Like, I don't need my PLC. I think we're hearing enough information, that kind of thing. So we'll talk. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, I'm speaking as president of the union, uh, CSCA. I haven't really had to do this before, but I've got quite a few notes on this list. Uh, one that popped out right at me right away. Uh, would be item three, uh, adding two hours to custodial. Um, I'm glad for my members to get more hours, but what's painful in this that you may not see is that that brings this person up to six hours, and we had an eight-hour custodian that was reduced for lack of work, and so to give that two hours that he was reduced to six and turn around and give it to somebody else doesn't show me a lack of work just that somebody else is doing it. Mm. Could you give us, could you specifically, where are you looking? Oh, under change uh, number three, under change Number three, status. got it, Bird? Yeah. Down here. I'm down sorry. Here. Classified starts here. Francis, got it. Thank you. I, 
Thank you for that clarification. I'm going to get scrambled around. That's why I had to do the color because <laughs> I had quite a few questions on here. But that one to me was just the most glaring. Um, <clears throat> and I know the idea of benefits for employees, but I, I, I shared personally with Mr. Cantwell that sometimes I feel like a spreadsheet. Okay. And this is when I started with you. And I know it's a hard time to go from a spreadsheet to people. But when I have an eight-hour custodian that's looking at his co-worker that's now getting the two hours that he had just two months ago, I can't explain that. I haven't even had this conversation, and I haven't had the conversation with Andy. Um, but that's just one. Uh, custodial, which we'll probably hear about here in the next week or so, with the 11-month elementary school custodians, I was really disappointed, I think I've already said this, where the Miramonte PTA actually stepped up in this paying for custodial services for this month of July. I, that might be great for a PTA, but I don't think that's their place. Essential services is what we're about. Okay, so when I come down to substitutes, um, at the bottom of that page, number two, Virgilio Falero, and forgive me, Virgilio, Kind of like Camarillo, right? <laughs> I just blew it. <laughs> but it's got him listed as a Miramonte substitute on 7-2. We didn't even have a custodian on 7-2 because he's already been laid off. So <clears throat> I didn't write this report, but there's things like that that I just want to bring to your attention. I have a hard time looking at this list knowing that the classified employees' morale is not very good. Um, because we're seeing these things, we want to have the conversations, and we all understand the budgets are tight. And I'm not trying to get $110 out of a $100 budget. I'm trying to keep the budget real, and I think we've done that at the table with negotiations. We're still at negotiations, in fact, starting this next month. But when I see things like this on the page, there may be just a list of names to you guys, and I really appreciate this board in the years of all the questions and the depth of conversation. So thank you for the time to bring this up. I mean, for example, Summit, when those people were offered alternative jobs, um, the AM custodian was given a PM offer. If we had this board meeting at 10 AM, it would have a whole different feel than it does at 5 PM. And when you take an AM custodian and give them a PM position, it's a whole different feel. That was part of the discussion. You may or may not have known that. Um, well, Chuck, can I ask about that? So yes. my understanding is that is that under the contract and under the you know, effectively the, the the contract we have with uh, the um, classified employees, that that they're bumping rights. Is that are you speaking of a bumping situation where someone went from AM to PM just no, because there was only a PM available somewhere? That was and what, what, that and what was are you suggesting offer. would be the alternative? Well, to hear tonight about them going to be cleaning the school when they rent the property up there, that was work that somebody was already doing, right? And the facility will still be used. And talking about the grounds and that, it's like I'm having trouble with some leadership. I've, I've been quite honest with Andy, and I think he has with me as well. Mm -hmm. But the enthusiasm of some of the leadership here. I don't feel that they're as respectful of the classified employee. Um, and for a custodian that has a 7 o'clock start time and they come in at 5.30 in the morning, I don't know that the district can accommodate that. And that's kind of what we came to up there at that situation, that somebody's coming in early. We have in our contract a half hour uh, waiver for start time. Anything beyond a half hour is a negotiable thing. But to go from 5.30 in the morning to 11 a.m., so the job was declined on that one, but that's not even on here. But what I'm bringing it up is that every teacher, every principal, when they come back in a week's time, I hope their schools are okay, because that's our number one function, is to make sure that those classrooms are teachable. And I've given up, I'm sorry to say honestly with you on the outside, I mean water is a big part of what we're dealing with, and to simply say, I'm asking teachers and principals do not have the kids hang around the trunk of trees. This drought has caused so much devastation to landscapes on the outside. It's 
find your shade at the time of day that you're going to be out there and have your activities there because the stress on our trees, as you guys know I've said before, um, the outside of my landscape is based on water right now. The inside of the classrooms is based on what? All the elementary schools were reduced a whole month. So since we probably can't talk in detail about specific individual assignments in this meeting, Right, and, and that's I why I was just holding it to the end. that you hadn't had a chance to talk to Andy about this yet. That's is that correct. correct. That is correct. Is, does this need to be handled tonight, or can there be time? I'll be reaching out to tomorrow morning. Well, and the reason I asked to speak tonight, uh, thank you for this, is because this goes to the Personnel Commission on Thursday. And um, the last time I spoke at the Personnel Commission meeting was when we were offering benefits to a uh, management position which didn't happen and, and Andy actually pulled that position because I was again upset is that I got this big target on the spreadsheet <laughs> that says benefits you know and so I'm laughing but it's not funny I don't well if I understand the process nothing goes to the Commission until the superintendent decides that he wants a change that the Commission needs to review is that correct they receive this report after you guys do Right. The, the personal activity. Right, so if we were to, to say it, uh, that's right. Right. Sorry. a motion to approve the consent calendar except for item 8.1.1, .1, how would that affect? That Is would that be perfectly suggesting? acceptable and we could then, based on conversation that Chuck and I will have, can, uh, bring, we can bring that back on or keep it off in future meetings. But if, I mean, these people already know these things, don't they, or no? Oh yeah, everyone's already, it's already taking place for everyone and the layoff notices were approved back in April and, and Chuck, you and I haven't spoken uh, since you've seen this, but I do feel that we had four consecutive meetings over that two week span where each of these positions were discussed extensively and this was the conversation that CSEA agreed to with the district. So it's not, this isn't a brand new conversation, it's one that again was our entire negotiations in the spring, but um, I think that said, I mean, it, based on Mike's and Jane's suggestion and seemingly your belief you can work within that idea, then maybe we should just... Yeah, well, absolutely. But I, I don't... I, I, what my question is, okay, so let's just take that one employee as an example. So you say, okay, well, you know, guess what? With those two hours we told you we were going to add on, we're not going to add them on because we're going to give them back to the six-hour employee. You're still affecting somebody now. That person already knows they're expecting two more additional that they've, hours, right? That's correct. They've and they're already, already they've working They've already begun it. working that, yeah. They, they've I, already been working it. See, and this is where I found out yesterday when I was mowing at Miners Oak School. I know the schedule's tight for everybody, and I'm not blaming anybody, but the first sentence on this page says, approval or ratification of the following personnel changes is requested. This is what this is asking of you. Mm -hmm. So I'm asking that it not until we have this conversation because that's only the one example that jumped out at me. But elimination of positions on 828, that's the four of the three summit positions. I mean, it, when the way this report is written, like for example, I have an IA that's now become a custodian. Where's her training? Uh, that would be uh, number nine. So I'm going to move that we pull this from the consent calendar. Yeah, I agree. The it entire seems report. Like there's some yeah, this, this, this entire item. Okay. Yeah, there, there needs to be some more detailed conversation, yeah, certainly between conversation Andy and Chuck. Okay, thank you. Uh, great. That works for you? Absolutely. Okay. Chuck, thank you. Thank um, you. Thank so that's what we'll do. You'll take thank it offline. So I'll um, the motion to approve so the consent calendar without item input or input Right. I would expect uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Um, okay. Well, that was our consent calendar, and that's the end of our meeting. Thanks, everybody. That's it.